Uh, good morning and can I welcome everyone to the third meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones as they can interfere with the sound system and as meeting papers are provided in digital format uh, on tablets, you may see members using these devices but it's, I am reassured, only to access our briefing papers to inform our, our questioning during the session. So that's what's happening if you see that. Uh, we have received no apologies for this morning's meeting and we'll move straight on to agenda item one, which will be declaration of interests. Uh, so can I invite uh, Ruth McGuire? Uh, who's joining our committee to declare any relevant interests. I have no relevant registrable interests to declare, Convener. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth, and welcome uh, to the committee. And uh, whilst it was only a brief stint, can I put on record our thanks to Mary Evans, who engaged fully in the work of the committee in the short time she was here. So thanks to, to, to Mary for that. So on to agenda item two, which is decision on taking business in private. Uh, so we have to decide whether to take items four and five in private. Can I ask members if they're agreeable to that suggestion? Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So, playing on to agenda item three, which is the independent review of the Scottish planning system. Uh, and we'll be taking evidence on the independent review of the Scottish planning system from members of the independent panel and will be followed by the Minister for Local Government and Housing. So, can I uh, thank uh, John Hamilton and Petra Bieberbach for coming along this morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, and we're very grateful for, um, yep, I've got that, yeah, I'm very grateful for you coming along. Uh, it's been indicated, Petra, that you might make a, an opening statement on behalf of you both, if that's been intimated to you in advance. Yeah. We'd very much welcome that, and that then we'll right? move to some questions. Thank Great. you. Do I have to press anything, or? No, it's not just at automatically, all. okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Petra Rewach uh, of PASS, formerly known as Planning Aid, and my colleague is John Hamilton of Winchborough Development Limited. As you know, we are members of the independent panel appointed by the former Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil in September 2015 to undertake a review of the Scottish planning system. The panel of three was chaired by Crawford Beveridge, who is chair of the Scottish Government's Council of Economic Advisers. Unfortunately, Crawford is unable to attend the committee meeting today. We are very grateful to have this opportunity to address the committee today following submission of the panel report in May this year. Just to uh, elucidate, we bring the following skills and experience. For myself, as Chief Executive of PASS, I lead a small team supporting over 420 volunteers who provide independent advice, information and educa education programmes on how to get involved in the planning system. They're primarily planning professionals. I also chair the Planning and Access Committee of Loch Lomond National Park Authority, and I'm on the board of Zero Waste and the Link Group and National Housing Association. John is the Chief Executive of Winchborough Development Limited, which is the company delivering the largest housing growth area currently under construction in central Scotland. He's the immediate past chair of the Scottish Property Federation and is a member of the SS SPF Police Board. He's also served as non sorry, policy board. Policy. Yeah. <laughs> Distinction. He also served as a non executive board member of City of Edinburgh Council's twenty first century homes for the first six years of the programme. The terms of reference set out by the then Cabinet Secretary talk, called for ideas to improve planning in six key areas. Development planning, housing delivering, planning for infrastructure, streamlining development management, leadership resources and skills, and community engagement. During the course of the review, we received in excess of 400 written submissions and heard oral evidence from more than 100 people. Given the relatively short period that was allowed for the production of our report, we believe that the scale of the response from the planning profession, the development and house building industries, and from the public reflects the need for wide ranging reform of planning in Scotland. Our report contains a total of 48 recommendations in the six areas identified in the Cabinet Secretary's brief and was submitted immediately prior to the Scottish Government election on the 5th of May. This is an important point. The recommendation we regard as interlinked. So, for example, creating early engagement in the development plan making process requires community councils to be involved at a much earlier stage. We are delighted the Minister now in post with responsibility for planning, Mr Kevin Stewart, has already delivered an official response by the Scottish Government to our report and is setting up a number of working groups to take forward reform and address recommendations where further evidence is required. We are encouraged that the Minister is continuing the fast pace in the process for reform with a target set for production of a white paper around the turn of the year and with the aim of producing a new planning bill in 2017. 
This is a demanding timescale on a range of complex and interdependent processes, but we believe it's correct to maintain the impetus towards reform, which we believe has been gained by the recent publication of the report. We are aware that ongoing constraints on public sector finance at both national and local authority levels, additional budgetary pressures created following the, European, the recent European referendum are likely to lead to severe challenges and difficulties and difficult decision on where the focus for the reform should be. We believe, however, that in virtually any economic circumstance in the foreseeable future, there is a proven need for the report's recommendation to be taken into account for in future work, which is now being undertaken in forthcoming legislation. We trust that the committee will agree that the reform on the basis of the, based on this recommendation is essential for the achievement of key economic, sustainable and social development targets, including improvements which lead to more inclusive society, economic growth, housing delivery, and in associate community and land reform legislation. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, can we move to questions? And uh, Kenneth Gibson to open up first question. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener, and uh, good morning uh, to our panel members. Um, I'm looking at the key recommendations made in the report, and the first one includes a requirement to set out regional house building targets. I'm just wondering what you actually mean by regional, whether it's local authority or some wider context. Uh, and just to put that in context, on the 29th of June, when the minister was giving evidence and asked him specifically about the 10,000 uh, house, uh, houses a year that the Scottish Government is uh, looking to build, whether that would be proportionate, and he said it would be demand-led. So I'm just wondering how a demand-led system would, would work along with regional house building targets and how that might dovetail. Samuel? Well, yeah, one of the uh, points or issues that you know we noted in in the course of the review is that uh, housing targets are uh, more or less seen as a sort of snap top, snapshot in time, and uh, it's, it's quite difficult for uh, planning authorities at uh, local development plan level and in the strategic development plans to be fully aligned all of the time on the basis that these are. Uh, snapshots are made in, over periods of years. So alignment with uh, housing policy, you know, specific housing policy as distinct from planning policy can be quite difficult to, to achieve. Um, what we were looking at is uh, a recommendation on a, a regime that would, at the top level, look at the, the requirements for housing on the, the national scale. Um, at the moment, we, we have strategic development plan uh, plans and planning authorities, and it seems to us to, to, us to be quite cumbersome in how these targets are, are filtered down to local levels. We do see that the need to maintain regional targets because we have, you know, specific, you know, large or relatively large urban areas in central Scotland and in the northeast. And uh, you know we see it as being essential that there's an effective uh, assessment of housing demand in those areas. Um, so there must be regional assessments, and I, I think we would anticipate you know a lot of the work around that being done potentially with uh, the type of city deal uh, structures and funding structures that are coming uh, beginning to emerge now, and uh, the funding that would come from that. But we're conscious also of the need for communities to, to be represented. Essentially, we are. There is a recommendation in the report that the strategic development planning authorities may be reviewed and their role would have to change so that there's closer alignment uh, from national uh, planning policy and the national uh, planning framework uh, with a, sort, a, a shorter management chain, if you like, through to regional levels, but also with the ability of uh, communities to be re represented at the regional levels. I just don't mean to know what you mean by regional level. I mean, for example, Ruth and I both uh, are MSPs in North Ayrshire, which is one of three Ayrshire local authorities. So would you mean by region, would you mean Ayrshire, would you mean North Ayrshire, would you mean the west of Scotland, um, and, and how is west of Scotland defined, the old Strathclyde region, the, the west of Scotland, you know, electoral region? I mean, th I'm trying to pin down what you actually mean by the word regional. Yeah, I, I think you know, we, so would, we, we're talking about. we would concede that, you know, one of the, the issue about the definition of a region is something that we yeah. found... Uh, quite difficult actually to, to pinpoint. It's possibly something that, you know, it does require 
some further work. But by the term region, we were anticipating, you know, not in any sort of political structural sense, but uh, something that would be allowed uh, uh, on the basis of, you know, the, the old regional authorities. But, you know, these are now being replaced by, you know, large city authorities. And we have a difference between the large city authorities and uh, smaller local authorities. So, uh, you know, I think it is something we, we probably would concede that, uh, you know, we, we aren't specific enough, you know, at this stage in the, the report and how we're defining a, a region. Okay, just on your 4.8 of your report, you say planning sorry, is not well. Sorry, Mr. Gibson, apologies, Petra, I, I, I missed you. Oh, sorry, no, no, that's okay. I just wanted to add to that because obviously we took it from what was the role of strategic development planning authorities and what can we do here to create a greater efficiency rather than just having yet another layer of, of plan making. Mm -hmm. So I think one, one of the things, and it's probably the hallmark of this particular uh, uh, approach, is to leave the detail to many other stakeholders. We made recommendations by looking at the evidence in front of us. Some of the details will have to be worked through and, we, and other um, larger stakeholder involvement is now looking at precisely those kind of questions. I think that's important to bear in mind. We made recommendations. Some of them, hopefully, most of them will be taken on board, but exactly how it works, we, we've discussed the principle of what's, what's not working currently in the, in the Scottish planning system. Okay, well, just on, on that um, basis, in 4.8 of your report, you say planning is not well placed to ensure it provides the right types of housing to meet the diverse needs of communities. And uh, in 4.12 of your report, you say it's difficult to find a definitive reason for the <coughs> continuing low levels of housing delivery and to pinpoint planning's influence uh, in this. I mean, certainly from my uh, perspective, we have numerous uh, housing development plans being put forward. And one of the issues, of course, is there's always significant local resistance People who are themselves well housed don't seem to be too keen on other people necessarily being well housed in their area. They're all keen on new housing as long as it's somewhere else. And it's about how you try and deal with these, these issues because there's a whole... Well, one of the things we've talk, you've talked about in your report is community engagement, but at the same time you're talking about barriers to, um, to more housing development and those two things can often be very contradictory. I'm just wondering how you feel we can move to try and square that circle with giving people a feel as if they've got an input, but at the same time ensuring that NIMBYism doesn't defeat you know, uh, a, a host of uh, um, necessary housing developments. Absolutely. I think this gets really to the nub of the problem in that we have seen almost planning being used like addressing a democratic deficit. I, local, local communities feel we, that's the only chance we ever have. Somebody will listen to us. And I think to some extent what we want to see is a, is a mature debate about the kind of needs that society requires. So housing is part of that. And we have a, a, a real housing shortage, especially around affordability, affordable homes. We also need to have that debate at a much wider national level and perhaps, and I think it aligns with what we, one of the recommendations is to have it, to, a di discussion in Parliament around MPF and housing requirements. And that then can filter through, once the acceptability by the elected members is, is, is there, then that debate can be taken into the local communities and sites can be identified. I think we should also perhaps remind ourselves that we need very different housing tenures for the future. Perhaps some of the models that we see emerging in continental Europe and in other parts is more housing cooperative, more self-built, more um, you know, in-town in delivery above the shop. We only have one area which the simplified planning zone actually deals with that. So I do think we need to look at it much more creatively rather than the kind of large scale that sometimes that's what people envisage and that's what people then uh, fight against. But if we are more involving those very actors, such as community councils, in the earliest opportunity, become involved in development plan making rather than development management. That kind of negative attitude can actually be turned around, and we've seen it happening. Okay, just for the one for the point, convener. Thank, thank you with your indulgence, and it's just um, on a, a slightly other a different issue. Well, a, a different issue. It's about reporters. Uh, you've said in 3.10 some fundamental questions about the role of reporters and who they represent have been raised with us. Now, from my perspective, it's, I mean, I think it's ridiculous that when a report, uh, reporter finishes his or her work in January, it's July before a minister gets a report on their table. Uh, it's six months to write a report. But, but on, so I wonder if you can comment on that. And the other thing I would ask on that is that you talk about planning fees to increase and to ensure full cost of recovery for planning authorities. Would that inc include the cost of uh, public local inquiries? Um, yes, the... 
we, we aren't recommending that the fees would be increased to, to take account of uh, public inquiries. So, you know, we are looking at, you know, means of making, uh, you know, planning more effective and, and ensuring more effective consultation with, with communities. At the moment, the planning, the cost of planning in local authorities is, you know, quite drastically underfunded and it's a fairly consistent picture across, across all the, the local authorities where they, they only recover quite a small uh, proportion through fees of the uh, the planning the planning system so we are our recommendations in terms of fees are more in terms of looking at the uh, the management of the the planning system increasing fees but possibly having uh, more uh, options and how uh, the type of planning applications that, that can be made at the moment uh, major planning applications are, are applications that consist of for example more than than 50 houses and it's a you know it's, it's a capped figure that's allowed for those uh, uh, in those planning fees uh, when we compare that to south of the border there, there are other uh, types of uh, applications that can be made that uh, potentially would involve outcome agreements or you know some form of uh, effectively a, a contract if you like between planning authorities and applicants in what each of those uh, parties would have to uh, provide in order for a, a full you know planning and, a, and a, an effective decision to, to be made so you know we do see that uh, the, there's a, a, a need for slightly more uh, choice in the, the type of plan, planning fees or planning applications that would be, be made and we and we see that as a, a means where local authorities could recover more of the you know the cost to the local authority. Okay, Mr. Uh, probably going to have to, oh, sorry, I'm not going to ask anything. I'm just wondering yeah. about the report. Or Question issue. about reporters, <laughs> and you're absolutely right. We do have heard lots and lots of evidence that um, elected members, but also community, felt aggrieved by the lack of transparency and also the lens it took sometimes for reporters to report back. And so we want to repurpose the role of the reporter as a sort of uh, playing a part at the, the gate check, i.e., at the start of a of a of a of a plan making, and where the reporter is almost like in the role of the mediator, but also has to has to feed back very quickly to the community what is actually what he or she, she perceives. So there is a I think there is a repurposing of the reporter's role required very urgently. Okay, thanks. Now before we move on. Um, Graham Simpson, is, is that a supplementary in something that's been raised already before we move on to the next topic? Get, uh, not, not exactly. Um, just, it kind of follows on no, from things not, they've said. So we've, we've got other bids coming in, so if you bear with me, I'll, I'll take you in, in a second. Uh, I do have a follow-on from it, and then I'll take Elaine in to ask about um, equal right of appeal. Uh, my follow-on is in relation to community engagement, which, we, which uh, Mr Gibson was talking about as well, and I think, Petra, you'd mentioned about planning opportunities being seen as an op as because of a deficiency in local democracy, people oppose something because it's an empowerment aspect, that planning process. And another empowerment aspect of the planning process is quite often the mooting of Section 75 agreements. I, I know in my local area, whenever there's developments proposed, the first thing communities understandably think, oh, this is great, there's new social or affordable housing coming to our area, or it's private housing, we think, how can this enhance our wider area? And Section 75 agreements are one of the, the ways that that can be done. I know there's a there's been a diminution of the use of Section 75 agreements over, over the years, so that's cause for concern. But, but likewise, I suppose the idea of the, the infrastructure levy, there could be, sounds fantastic in theory, but I suppose my concern might be that it, it hoovers up developer contributions and takes potential community benefits away from a community that is impacted by a development. So is there a is there a kind of tension there between rather than getting rid of Section 75 agreements, would it be better to see a more strategic use of them for community benefit, perhaps? And how do we square the circle with the the, the, the infrastructure levy. So some more information on that would be quite welcome. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to answer the point in Section 75. So, um, the, the Section 75 uh, system, you know, ha has its drawbacks. I agree there is a there is a tension here because um, it's primarily intended to, to mitigate the, the impact of, of development. But, you know, as time has moved on and we had the 2006 Act, uh, there, there's been so far no 
introduction though and uh, you know a planning levy as such so we still have essentially the same section 75 process um, following the, the recession in 2008 um, section 75 contributions that may have been coming through the, the pipeline you know largely dried up um, so the private sector uh, to quite a large extent you know stopped making those those contributions and as I say that's Partly because you know they may argue that it wasn't a system that was designed for, say, the funding of uh, secondary schools, you know, full secondary schools or uh, major transport in intersections. You know, more of the sort of heavy weight and the, the funding of that, you know, I would I believe you know has to be looked at jointly between the, the private sector and the, the public sector, and Section 75 contributions. Um, don't aren't really effective in, in doing that in every case. Can, can I just be clear whether we're talking about recommending ending Section 75 agreements or the improved use of them alongside an infrastructure levy? We're not recommending that we would end Section 75 contributions. I think there will still be a, a place for them. Mm -hmm. I, I think you know there has to be a recognition that there's a limitation on the on the use of Section 75s uh, to major public infrastructure. Could, could I ask one final question on that? Uh, and I suppose I would, okay, my very localised example, and members are terrible at doing this, I'll indulge is, is convener. So 600 new homes coming to Hamilton Hill in my area, an area desperately need of regeneration. There's some long-standing residents that have stuck it out and they're there and they have their homes. They're really keen to be discussing with the planning authority and the housing association what that new community looks like. So they think it would be great to have a a small tenants hall in that area so rather than 600 houses it'll be 600 houses plus one small hall and can that somehow be part of that co-production model and could section 75 be used for that and i don't ask you to comment on that but that's just to illustrate the point that section 75 agreements might be better a discussion between the developer and the local community more than a developer and the planning authority and perhaps the developer and the planning authority's discussion should be about the infrastructure levy rather than the community benefit because the communities know the community benefits better than the planning authority in my experience i i, I would like to answer that because I, I think that's all about the scale of those contributions and again when a section 75 it effectively is and it can it's often a negotiation done privately between uh, the planning authority and and the developer now i think that the scale or uh, you know each of these uh, issues which may be you know subject to a section 75 if they are at you know appropriate scale where uh, communities you know would be able to get uh, you know become party to to those neg negotiations i think i think that would be quite correct you know but that may be at quite quite low scale as I say the problem we have at the moment is when it comes to the funding of major infrastructure you know the, the, the community are removed from that they're not party to that and uh, you know the section 75 negotiations are not in that sense completely transparent either yeah, can I just add a point, and that is Section 75 is just, is just an instrument. If you really want to move community engagement proper into this, what I mentioned before, participatory planning, then actually the, the communities are involved at the stage where these houses are being allocated, being discussed. Their intelligence is being sought in terms of where, when, and how. So rather than just waiting at this final point when it's already done, does, and then there's negotiations starting with the developer as to what additional... Um, additional benefits can be had for the local authority. I really think we need to move to a much more mature, much earlier dialogue and not wait until 600 and then community states, okay, this is how what we would like to see. And that's the whole thrust of this reform is really trying to make it much, much more front loaded because I think if there was a failure, again, 2006, it's partly because the community, the Planning Act in 2006 did promise some better community engagement, but we had 2008 recession and very little, I think, in terms of the spirit was actually realised. So we still have many, many communities out there who not readily engage, who don't even know that there's such a thing as a planning system. And only when it comes to the latest point are they starting to say, I want to be in there. That's really helpful. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, convener, and thank you both for coming along this morning and for your report. Um, before I move on to questions on the theme of, of uh, equal right of appeal, though, 
I noticed when you're introducing yourselves, I had a, a quick question. Whilst I know the, the government appointed the three of you, could I just ask, do any of you have um, a, a, a planning qualification or a community qualification, or is it a business background? That's something that occurred to me when you were introducing yourselves. Well, do you uh, my background is uh, as well. It's a business background uh, and as a surveyor developer in the house building industry, but also in regeneration. Um, yeah, I started my career in the 70s in regeneration in Glasgow, which was primarily about tenement refurbish, tenement refurbishment and uh, the gear project in the east end of Glasgow. But my my background is in uh, uh, development. Sorry, I'm not interviewing you, but I've just yeah. had occurred to me when you were introducing yourselves, it might be. My background is in sustainable development and uh, and in European law. So, and I have worked with communities, yeah, for the last 20 years. So in both, um, I was appointed by COSLA, sustainable working there, and also at Heritage Ward University, looking at uh, uh, greener infrastructure and so on. So that's uh, my background. Okay. Thank you very much. Not business. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, convener. So, um, in the introduction on your report, uh, under 1.8, you, you talk about restoring community trust in the system. We've talked a bit about that <coughs> with the previous lines of questioning. Um, and the committee has a petition that we've inherited about equal rights of appeal, and we did indicate to petitioners we might raise some of these issues this morning. So, I think we're moving on to that, convener, if I'm right. So, um, my question specifically would be that although of the 400 respondents to your consultation, not everybody um, expressed a view about appeal rights in the planning system, but 70% of those who did express a view on equal rights of appeal favoured the possibility. And it is something that's been around in this parliament practically since I can remember, since 99, um, as an issue. So, I think that given that the majority who, who did respond on that issue albeit there was no specific question on that issue, um, they did respond in favour of that. I wondered whether you, or could, maybe you could tell us why you didn't think it was appropriate to refer the matter for further um, government consideration. Basically, you concluded that, that, that you weren't persuaded that a third party right of appeal should be introduced. So why did you not consider that the government should perhaps look at it more? And I suppose, secondly, what evidence did you, did you take to inform that recommendation? Who wants to go on that one? Uh, on. Well, I, I, I'm happy to, to lead on that one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, firstly, you know, I think it was uh, a sort of overwhelming, you know, requirement of our report that, you know, we would produce a report that uh, could deliver a more effective planning system. Uh, we agree that, in fact, I think, you know, we deal in, you know, quite a amount of depth here, you know, there are deficiencies in, in our planning system. And, you know, we were addressing this from the need to make planning, the planning system in Scotland more effective and, uh, and pa as part of that requirement to make improvements for local communities and how they would become part of the, uh, or how they could con contribute to the planning system. You know, one of the things that I wasn't aware of until we, we did this report is that there, there are over 2,000 registered community councils in Scotland already. And now, obviously, you know, that number of organisations has a pretty, you know, it's paltry the amount of funding that those organisations have. But the fact is that they, they do exist. And I think we avoid, you know, the use of the word NIMBY in a report, but it's already been mentioned in here. And, you know, I don't think there's any great... Uh, uh, argument that you know that sort of uh, attitude from a lot of parts of the community who are well housed uh, may be a barrier towards you know delivering improved housing for other people. So we did approach this from the point of view that we do see the need for communities to be far better represented. As a step change from where we are just now, we think those communities uh, must have a better and a clearer role to, to play in the planning system. Uh, we were looking at a, a process where, and again, you know, because there's a large number of them, we would see, we'd see it as being a great difficulty that they, they would each have the right to be represented in a, a local development plan. But a number of communities that we met put forward their own uh, community plans, which some of which were well received in their local authority areas and, and some others weren't. So I think we would see a, a process where 
uh, community councils may at least have the, the ability and the option to, to opt in, as it were, into the formulation of a, of a development plan and, and have their voice heard at that stage. Petra, do you want yeah, to add? Just to add to that, I think if you, if you know that the, the, the kind of journey that we're on is to have more collaboration, is to have more involvement, is to have a kind of national debate about what society needs, what its requirements are, how it looks after its uh, excluded groups, because there are plenty of uh, groups that are outside the planning process. We had evidence presented from across the UK. We looked at, we had um, academics who have worked both in, 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 in the UK as well as in Ireland. We listened to their views. And overwhelmingly, the evidence was that if we looked at the system of introducing third party right of appeal, A, Scotland would be the first one to do that, which would, in, in this kind of current climate, would be quite challenging. Secondly, the definition of who is the third party in all of that is very challenging. It could be used as vexatious by another appellant. And if we're having now, the third, the third point also being is that the evidence from, from academics in Ireland, that it is actually becoming a more centralised rather than local process because the decision is being taken out. For all of those reasons, and we have listened to uh, plenty of evidence, we also tested with some of the uh, community councils who we wanted to hear because many of them were cited as being the ones that are wanting to see third party right of appeal. When we had a discussion with them about approaching a change of rule for them being early engaged rather than at the very end, each, each one of them felt that early engagement and their strategy role being in that early process of development plan making and enhanced resourcing is far better than waiting. And, you know, appeal is, has a sort of, has a notion of them and us. And that's not, I think, what, what we wanted to see in this kind of reform. We wanted to have something that is far more inclusive, that can be more um, proactive. And I think, yeah, I feel also... When it was first muted, that was in 2005, during the, we're now in 2016, we now have the Community Empowerment Act, we now have land reform, we now have the uh, post Christie. a lot more communities wanting to take on certain things. There is no such thing as one community and one community voice. Elaine, yeah, do you want to develop that further? Yes, uh, please. Other members are what to come in on this Thank you. Well. I don't know where to start developing it further, but perhaps I can start by saying, actually, it goes much further back in this Parliament with private members' bills being discussed and talked about. So it's been a running theme through the Parliament. Now, I'm not sitting here to argue about whether or not these rights of appeal are right or not. I suppose what I haven't heard an answer to is, um, given that you're now telling me the people you took evidence from on the issue, why was it not a question in the first place for more people perhaps to respond to and, and give you more evidence on? So it wasn't there as a, a call in the first place. Some people chose, because it's a big issue for them, to put it in their evidence to you, even though it wasn't a specific question. And I suppose, secondly, um, you know, it's not just about housing with respect. And, and I think that nimbyism perhaps is also just a wee bit overplayed. If you look at the Irish... Uh, situation, then it's perhaps a bit over exaggerated. But secondly, and, and sorry, sorry, thirdly, it's not just about housing. So you have something, for example, like um, plans for a private developer to build an incinerator. Council refuses it, community don't want it. But the person that does have a right of appeal in that case is the developer. And if the developer then appeals, then the community and the council can and have been overturned. So actually, um, what Petra said about, about appeals sometimes um, not being the right way forward, well, if that's the case that the community shouldn't be taking appeals because it's maybe not the right way forward, what about the fact that developers can then take appeals and then community wishes and local wishes of councils can be overturned? So these are, these are themes, and I suppose my, my final question on it is, why, why not take specific evidence on this and why not ask the government to explore it further? Because I don't think we do have all the answers on it. You mentioned earlier on a figure of 78% of respondents had wanted to see third party right of appeal. That was from the... 100 respond yeah. Sorry, convener. I said out of your 400 respondents, not all of them responded on this issue, which exactly. is unsurprising since exactly. you didn't ask it as a specific question. But for those who did respond on the issue and raised it, 70, 70 not 78, 70% of them we're interested in seeing third in equal rights of appeal. Mm -hmm. Give Petra a chance to yep. kind of, uh, answer that. Yeah. I think this is a this is a fundamental question here. You mentioned incinerator, and you're saying that incinerators, you know, communities don't want them. But at the same time, we're having a huge target in terms of our our um, 
um, how we deal with our waste. We have a huge target in terms of green energy. So these are national debates. Do we leave that at a local level to decide? Uh, no, I'm going to, and Graham, I'm taking you in next, but I, th I think the specific question Elaine was asking about why didn't you ask the question in the first place, I think, was a reasonable question. I, I don't have the, the original brief here, yeah. but, you know, certainly there were, you know, there were, there were uh, questions phrased in there in terms of even the, the debate about, you know, whether the, the debate was about third party right of appeal or whether it was about equal right of appeal. That, that came up. You know, this was not, you know, just brushed aside. And, you know, I would have to go back and look exactly at what the the framework of those questions were, but, but it was certainly in there. The Minister, I think, the minister I think, said yeah. the brief that the, the, we got the brief from, from the uh, Cabinet Secretary on the six themes. We then had a special session where the third party right of appeal was discussed. Provide more information, perhaps, in writing to the committee on that. That, that, mm -hmm. that would be really helpful. I know some of my colleagues want to come on that. Graham Simpson. Yeah, um, I should declare an interest that I'm uh, still a councillor uh, in South Lanarkshire. Um, so just to develop the theme on uh, third party rights of appeal, um, do, you not, do you not see the problem here is that what, what, what you're suggesting is you allow a system that we, we currently have where developers like yourself, Mr. Hamilton, um, can appeal um, if uh, your development uh, was, was rejected, you could appeal, but the communities that you say want more involved could not appeal. Do you not see the, the issue there? No, I don't see the issue. I mean, what, what we are uh, you know, looking to, to achieve here is you know, a more focused and more direct planning system where developers would be constrained and would be guided by an effective uh, development plan in, you know, on the basis of those, uh, those, those applications. You know, I would have no sympathy for a developer who makes an application, you know, that runs completely contrary to a, a local development plan. And, uh, you know, if that was appealed and it was refused, then that developer, you know, has to make their own choice about the business plan that they put behind it, you know, how much investment they put in, firstly, to a planning process, and then secondly, you know, to the delivery of that, that planning application. Um, you know, we're talking about, and I appreciate this is not all about housing, but, you know, we require a step change in the number of houses that we're building across all tenures in Scotland. And those are very, very, you know, significant business investment decisions that would have to be made around that. And other, you know, large-scale projects that, that are being mentioned in, you know, in incinerators, that there's a crossover between the, the needs of the public sector and having those types of projects delivered and what the, the business community and the investment community will have the confidence to put behind them to, to see them being achieved. Um, yeah, just to say, the, the, the third party right of appeal came out of the discussion that there hadn't been sufficient community engagement. What we're trying to do here is front load much, much more community engagement at the earliest opportunity. At the same time, I do think that um, if, we, if we're narrowing it just down to a third party or equal party, who defines the party? We had recently, we had Portobello High School, which drove a community, which drove a, a real big wedge in the community. So who is the third party there? I think it's, it's very, I rather see a much more proactive and engaged and inclusive system that doesn't need to have a third party right of appeal because we got it right. But at the moment, we don't have it right. Thank you. Now, just a, a brief follow-up. Could you have to go to Andy and after that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So if you get it, if you get it right, then perhaps you don't need any so, sort of appeals. Perhaps you don't need Mr. Hamilton to appeal there um, if he's not happy. Uh, so if it's, if it's done right, you don't yeah. need any appeals. I think that's fair right. comment. You know, if, if it's absolutely right, but I'm not recommending, but if, if that's a, a suggestion, then... You know, in principle, yes. You know, if we have a perfect planning system, we would not have we would not have right of appeal. But we are a recommendation is, a, a, you know, it's heavily geared towards improving the planning system and making sure that planning applications are made to reflect uh, national planning policy and uh, local development plans. 
Can I just add, in my, in my day job, I work with communities up and down Scotland, and third-party right of appeal is the last thing that comes up. What is important is how do we make our voice heard? How do we make representation? How do we achieve something? So an island community like Rum, who wants to develop, who wants to grow, is becoming a developer. A development trust who takes on assets is becoming a developer. That is the proactive side that we're now seeing more and more. Mm -hmm. What community want to understand is when, how, and why their recommendations and the transparency in decision making feeding back to them. So I think we need just a more mature debate about saying. If, if I could add one thing, you yeah. know, as Peter, Peter was saying, you know, that there is a lot of interlink between, you know, what are apparently different recommendations in here, and you know, we do make, uh, you know, points about leadership through the planning system and making a commitment to planning policy, and I, I think this is part of that as well. You know, in fact, we're making recommendations on, you know, even at the level of a chief executive approving uh, a development plan. And, you know, th there has to be confidence from both the, the public sector and the private sector that planning policy is done, you know, set correctly, and, you know, we have a system that delivers against that policy. Um, my, my deputy commissioner is asking for supplementary, but Andy Whiteman has been very, very patient. So probably because of time, I'm going to have to say Andy for the final questions on equal right of appeal, third party of appeal, I'm afraid. Yeah. I can yes, just give I notice I to Alexander Stewart. <coughs> We're going to come to you next for planning enforcement. Okay. Because there's two new areas, uh, really. But I think just to sort of perhaps comment on the equal right of appeal issue, I mean, I, I take the point, Petra, you're making about if we can get earlier engagement. And I think that's the nub of it. If, and there's still a distrust... Um, and taking John's comment at the end there, I mean, if going forward we can uh, perhaps equalise the rights of appeal, <laughs> if you see what I mean, rather than... In see what you mean, but yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we can discuss that going forward. Yeah, we, we, we've looked at it in a slightly... Yep. Almost no, the other end of the telescope, I think. Yep. But, yeah. I've got two substantial points, a questions and one sort of minor one. First of all, you, I think you indicated at the beginning, Petra, you said that... Um, it's very, very important you see all your 48 recommendations as linked. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, the government's indicated an intention to take forward 10 of those 48. In other words, there's 38. It's not taking forward, at least at the moment. Are you concerned about what happens to those 38? And are you, have you got any issues with the extent to which the 10 that have been identified for early action, some of them may be linked to others that are not, and what we get might not be what your bold and I should say um, commendable vision is. I think, I think it would be fair to say it's a time scale. Can we just get some clarity around that? Yeah. My apologies, because um, I, I thought it was 10 for early action. And That's right, immediate action under, it's called. Under active yes. Consideration. yes, I was just going just to come to, be, to that, yeah, sorry, absolutely. Petra. It's yeah. immediate actions, so there are nine plus one that they... So, that, that's for action, because one is an inaction. And the other nine, yes, they've taken that on. The other 38, I think what's really commendable, and this is again in the spirit of this, of this report, is around collaboration. So there are a number of working groups now being set up across the different six themes to look into the detail of how some of that can be delivered and how, how some of that can be worked through. Because the thing about, about planning is there are so many different stakeholders, so many different interests. And therefore, it is important that everyone has, a, has a, some sort of uh, input into that so that it becomes a shared experience and it comes forward. So I think the working groups are being set up from what we understand, and they're meeting already for the first time next week so to take further in more detail the recommendation. Because we made just recommendation. It may well be that others will feel they want some more, some, some more details. They want to work through some of that. So that's where, what I understand. And the time scale is quite ambitious. Andy? Okay, thank you very much. We'll obviously pick up some of that with the Minister um, later. Um, my second substantial point is around Recommendation 18 on land value uh, uplift. Um, in your view, how significant an issue is this in relation to the millions of pounds that flow as unearned increments currently to, to landowners? Who captures these now? Um, the mechanisms that have been in place, we've already heard Section 75 to potentially capture some of them at a later stage, who should capture them, and what would the implications be in moving towards a system more like we had at the beginning in 1947, and as I think still exists in Germany, um, where those are in a sense captured 
to provide public benefits at the outset to invest in infrastructure, good planning and all the rest of it, and, and, and house builders get ahead and build houses. Um, I think there, are, there is unfairness, you know, in the, the system we have just now where, um, you know, on the basis of a, a decision being made by an authority, uh, a piece of land can become or could become, you know, a great deal more valuable than it, than it is just growing crops. Mm -hmm. um, we do, you know, we have opened this up, as I say, you know, to the uh, potential for a, a land or a planning, a planning levy. And the reason for that is that even in the development and the house building industry, there's a recognition that the planning system, you know, confers value to, to land. But that doesn't always mean that every piece of land is profitable or is, or is effective. Um, what the house building industry needs is a, a you know a, a process where there's more certainty about uh, what the outcome in, in that piece of land or the value of that uh, piece of land with planning permission being being uh, being granted, because at the moment there's still t there's too much in uncertainty and it depends on the area and not every single region or every authority is the same, but it can be very difficult for uh, business plans to be put together that allow house building to, to progress where there's uncertainty around the cost of Section 75 contributions. Um, I think a few years back, probably a great deal of people in the house building industry would you know, react against any suggestion of a, of a, a land tax or, a, or a, a land levy. I think there's increasingly a realisation and you know, we heard evidence from Homes for Scotland and from in individual house builders that there is a realisation that this is all part of the, the process. That, you know, costs have to be met. A lot of these costs that you know, currently might flow to the original landowner may have to be you know, charged for the, the delivery of education or transport. Um, you know, the, the process, if it's working correctly, it will still result in a, in a fair payment to the landowner. Ultimately, people that, that own land, you know, we probably I'm not, you know, wanting into a discussion about CPO, but you know, where a piece of land is required as part of a, a local development plan or as part of a of part of a national policy, and then in some cases CPO is used. I think that you know, instinctively, we would try to avoid that so that we have a, a better and more effective system that still allows for land to be paid for, but also allows for infrastructure to be funded as part of a, the cost of a, of a development. I think, I think we've recognised that there is value in exploring this further. That was definitely in principle accepted. And it's not just about housing. If you look at infrastructure provisions, such as the Borders Railway, for example, that kind of yield that you see there, the uplift. So I think it's something that needs to be looked at in much more detail. But I think there's fits in very well with the land reform and that's the other thing that we found in terms of the 2006 act and what we're seeing now is the much greater buy-in by different departments and by different uh, local authority departments and scottish government departments to make make this this reform much much more uh, far-reaching okay thank you just one final little point a third one this is on your recommendation 16. um you talk about Scotland's diverse housing needs, and it's important to ensure that support for new sectors does not inadvertently provide opportunities to build mainstream homes which do not meet established needs. And you then go on to say, where special measures are introduced to promote the private rented sector, an assurance of the retention of use in perpetuity would therefore, in our view, be essential. Could you say a little bit more about what you mean by that and whether what you mean there applies to more than just the example you've used, which is the private rented sector? Yeah, the, the thing it does apply to to more. We have we have used the example of the private rented sector there, but um, it's you know an issue. I think that you know local authorities can be sensitive about um, and this is particularly the case in the, in West Lothian Council, where planning might be granted for a, a tenure which appears initially to to meet affordable housing requirements. Um, shared equity w would be an example. Mm -hmm where um, if there isn't uh, the ability to fix that type of tenure in perpetuity within a very short period of time, you know, possibly even months, and, you know, it could then, there could be an attraction to the 
owner of that property to put that property back into the market. Uh, now, in West Lothian Council, they have fairly strict uh, guidelines about how affordable housing must uh, be legally, the, the title must uh, require it to be affordable in perpetuity. Um, it does, that. that's a sort of older example, but it does sort of uh, cross over into the, the private rented sector where if similar title provisions aren't made, then a developer might, you know, uh, get a consent for private rented sector, you know, in the part of the market, uh, which, you know, in the short term meets that market. And then even on, you know, fairly big scale, you know, those uh, rented units could then be sold into the, the open market. No, I, that's Sorry. exactly what we we want to safeguard affordable housing. See what else have. Sorry. Yeah. No. So, so what you're really saying is you're proposing that the planning system, in terms of use classes, for example, should be able to incorporate a more fine-grained um, understanding of the use to which right. land yeah. property is is put. The example you cited of affordable housing, where this was already being done in West Lothian, for example, through title conditions through the legal process. By implication, you'd rather that seen through the democratic planning process, such that yeah. if, cons if consent were granted to, let's say, a retirement home or a, a student flat or disabled accommodation yeah. or social housing, mm -hmm. that those use classes then would have to be, uh, if anyone wanted to change those, they would have to apply in future. So you'd do it through the planning system rather than try and do yes. any complicated... Yes, uh, I think the student accommodation, that's a good example because... Uh, you know, it's it's relatively easy for a development or a, a planning permission to be granted for student accommodation, which at some point in the future, without you know any further analysis of you know in, ter in, in planning terms, may become flats. You know, it might become uh, market flats or you know. location. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Uh, can I just indicate that I am a serving member of Perth and Kinross Council. Thank you very much this morning for your presentation and for the report. Can I ask, I was surprised that there wasn't a lot in the report with the area under planning and enforcement, uh, because that whole area where we have, you know, building uh, control that hasn't taken place or, or has permission hasn't been granted and someone's built something on, uh, uh, within the process, uh, that, that is still a major concern across most local authorities. Uh, and you touched on uh, the, the financial constraints that many local authorities have, and that has a knock-on effect about how many planning enforcement officers or that nature that they may have. Uh, I'd like to have some views about what you see uh, as the, the complex issue that it is and how, going forward, uh, that it can be managed and challenged. I think you, that, that's really, really vital because for a lot of communities, and especially those that are interested around what's happening, seeing their action followed up is so, so crucial to build that confidence. But what's happening is the reality is that many local authorities, I mean, most, and if all local authorities, planning authorities, are really cash-strapped. It has not kept up with the pace in terms of planning fees and so on. And, and I think that something then will have to give. So we need to move towards a system where we have proper... Uh, resourcing of the, the of the planning system, where we have proper resourcing in terms of full cost recovery, to then actually identify those types of uh, function that will actually also help communities to feel there is trust in the system. Yes, if I phone them up, and and I had a recent case where somebody came to our advice service saying, in a in a in a conservation area, ten mature trees have been felled to make room for car parking. Weeks later, nothing. So that, that is the, the, the little things that actually really exercise people, which gives them planning a bad w name. Sorry. Yeah, I think, you know, perhaps uh, you, we could have made this point more strongly, but there are real powers of enforcement already yeah. in the planning, the planning Act. And, you know, I see these, I don't see these daily, but, you know, regularly I see, uh, you know, enforcement action being taken against developers and, and that action currently could mean that you know development quite quickly is stopped mm -hmm. or you know fines are, are applied towards developers as well I, I think it also goes with a recommend you know the recommendation we're looking for the whole investment in the, the planning system both in terms of the, the, the public uh, role in planning but also the, the private role in planning you know greater investment and, and that does you know probably mean a requirement for an increase in fees 
um, there isn't enough resource in the planning authorities, you know, within local authorities for planning officers to act also in, in many cases they have to act as management um, you know case officers and in, in enforcement and uh, unfortunately some of this does come down I think to you know a question of the resource and how uh, how valued the, the planning system needs to be that it has you've, you've you've come back with the right answer for me anyway that it needs to be managed effectively uh, I, I agree uh, and but but I, I think you, you you have to do that effectively uh, because if you don't uh, put your money where your mouth is then you're not going to be able to ma manage that process and yes there are opportunities for developers uh, when they do things wrong uh, for the opportunity for them to be then penalised. Uh, but some of them are quite happy to be penalised because knocking down a tree uh, that may may only have yeah, a, a about being stopped. Yes. And I have recently seen yes. you know threatened action for a, a you know quite a major development to be stopped, and that means that people who will have contracted with that house builder will not you know be able to conclude mm -hmm. entry to that property. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, convener. Okay, now I hope you're asking the right questions. I'm delighted it was confirmed you gave the right answers there. Uh, yes, for, for one of our members. Uh, I know Mr. Gibson wanted to ask supplementary on that. See, to be honest, actually, uh, Alexander touched on it. I mean, it was the issue of effectively the, the, the trees thing, whereby a developer actually not happily knocks down some trees, takes a, a small fine, and then, sp and then gets a dozen houses built, which they sell for a couple of million. And it's about trying to ensure that the punishment fits the kind of crime so to speak and that the that there are real barriers to people undertaking such action because it's actually happened in my constituents also so that was the only point i was wanting to make there convener so okay and could you you might want to follow up after that because i know you wanted a very specific yes, question in relation to island communities. one it was uh, uh, thank you convener it was in terms of um, your recommendation 11 you talk about given the special circumstances the island authority should be given more flexibility where this would better reflect the distinctive local context for planning an island setting and obviously I agree with that, and the Islands Bill will certainly encompass that. But in my constituency, I've got an island uh, of uh, 5,000 people, Aran, which is very distinctive from the rest of North Ayrshire, more than 10 miles off the coast of another island, Cumbria, which is more integral to North Ayrshire. Uh, but but uh, Aran itself, for example, a lot of the things that you've suggested here, an example, for example, encouraging broader, more creative use of schemes of delegation, uh, etc., could be bring forward in integrated terrestrial marine plans. Now, these all apply to some like Aaron as well, but although, so would, are you of the view that it would be that you that it should only be the island authorities, or do you feel there's room to manoeuvre in order that perhaps distinctive communities that form a, that are on islands uh, can also have a bit more flexibility and autonomy in terms of these issues? Yes, again, we, we've put it out there, and now I know that one of the working groups have been uh, inviting representatives of island communities along. To, to discuss in a bit more detail exactly how it should look, because especially around marine planning, there are some real, real challenges, and aligning that much better with the spatial planning, I think it requires all islands to have some sort of view, not just you know, island authorities. So, yeah, I think... It was just because your recommendation mentioned island authorities rather than yeah. island communities. It's not... It's Yeah, sorry. OK, thank you. Thanks for my helpful clarification. Yes, sorry, thank yeah, Mr. Gibson. Yeah. Could, could I indulge then uh, and ask another question... Uh, Myself, that I know with one of the recommendations is that development plans uh, in the future may be reviewed every 10 years rather than every five years. Now, my understanding is that uh, planning authorities do produce 10 year plans, but they're reviewed uh, in the middle of that in the, of that process. Now, whilst under such from my council colleagues, that can be a massive bureaucracy doing all of that. The concern I would have my experience of as an MSP and a local resident and engaging with Glasgow's development plan is I get a crate of documents given to my office and the area I lived in was earmarked for dramatic changes. I didn't know as the MSP, I didn't know as a local resident and the local authority clearly had no particular desire to engage with the community about what a local development plan would look like. Now, I'm one of these nimbyistic individuals, Mr Gibson, I don't know. I had some significant issues with it as a resident. Um, but I suppose, in the more general terms, I would be worried that errors in local development plans could be locked in for 10 years, and that would be a concern I would have. So I get that it works for planning authorities to have that 10-year plan and more stability and more structure and longer, more strategic views, but how do we make sure we get things right in the first place and actually co-produce some of those plans with communities rather than a planning authority just doing what planning authorities do? 
I do think that longer term planning can help to focus on delivery. I do think that some of the experience that we have currently with the system is the current system. What we're, what we're proposing is longer term plan, certain flexibility, but also linking it in terms of changing the role of the community councils. If your community councils have been a statutory consultee in your development plan, I'm sure more people would have heard about what was being proposed. If we're now seeing the on onset of, and North Ayrshire is a big example there because they're leading it Ayrsh North Ayrshire wide, lo locality plans being created together with community planning, having actually shared service delivery, understanding where the police, the health, education wants to go over the next few years. That, that makes it for a much better and integrated system where locality plans will have to be informed by the local people. So I do think some of the experience we have is, is born of the current system, which is not working as well as it should be. There's no doubt about it. What we're recommending is how we could be working much, much better. I, I suppose my reflection is if a planning authority uh, tries to promote or raise awareness and holds a meeting, uh, one man or one woman or Doug will turn up. If a local elected representative tries to get publicity for something that's happening in planning, you get a full town hall. So there's real lessons to be learned about what does it really mean to engage and when you do advertise and promote and roll out a consultation. There's sometimes a feeling from communities that the planning authorities are actually quite happy when very few people engage because that creates workload and, and, and issues around that. So is there a culture change with planning authorities? I think we want, to see, sorry, we want to see much more use of digital and social media. Again, 10 years ago, it hadn't been there. When we did a development in Balach, we had we set up a Facebook and lots and lots of people that wouldn't want to go into drafty community halls commented on that. So we need to be much more uh, innovative in the terms of how we use the social media, uh, both, both uh, Facebook, Twitter, but also Nowadays, we have um, the charrette process, which is very visually uh, attractive and can lead to much more um, sort of using 3D technology. So all of that is there that helps. And I think we need to embrace that much, much more. And we haven't done that in planning, whereas in other, in other policy areas, we have worked much more with the social media. Okay, Mr. Hamilton, did you want to add? Yes, I, I think you know, the role of uh, local members is, is absolutely key to this as well. And, uh, I would like to think that, you know, that's a sort of, I know that kind of scenario you described there can happen. I, I would like to think that, you know, we have a early consultation process where uh, local council members and local communities will see these things coming much earlier in the process and we'd be much more prepared um, so that there is there's still a balance here. But, you know, the five-year pro. I think we've, we've got two problems at the moment is that, things happen too quickly without you know, consultation, and then we fall into a, a five-year cycle, which is constantly repeated and constantly underachieved. Um, we have to get away from, from both of those, uh, those failures, I think. I promise I was listening to you, Mr. Hamilton. <laughs> I was getting bids for supplementary questions as you were answering that, that, that question. And I'm going to have the final question, not just now, but uh, I'll, Elaine Smith will ask that in a moment. I've got a couple of bits for supplementaries along along this theme, and uh, Graham Simpson first, and then followed by Andy Whiteman. Yeah, um, thanks, convener. Um, it, it, it was really just to follow up on the the, the whole community uh, engagement uh, theme, um, and you mentioned community councils. Um, I, I think all, all of us have had varied experiences with community councils. Um, one of one of the issues is that. They can just consist of very, very few people with their, their own agendas um, who don't actually engage with the communities that they're meant to serve. So I, I, I wonder if you'd looked at diff different models of engaging with the wider community, whatever we mean by that, um, other than community councils, which very often can't work, don't work. As well as community councils rather than instead of as well even, as because yeah. even the good community I mean, all community councils I go to are, are good and, and I'm not just saying that they are but by <laughs> but by def but by def I, I, I don't I don't know what Mr Simpson goes to there uh, he can stand to account for that but they're only representative of those who attend community councils which by definition is a tiny section of society so I think that's a really valid point how do you engage with the wider community out with community councils. We touched on that in our report. Community councils are the only ones that have a statutory role. 
So for many local authorities, planning officials, that's where they go to. However, increasingly what we're seeing with local locality planning, we're seeing that communities can elect their own representatives to sit on the locality plans. So these two things have to come together. Equally, I think it, it, it's, it's almost like if you have a particular instrument, then that attracts particular kind of people. So right now, community councils, statutory role is only limited to development management. That's a very much saying, I don't want that or I want that. No, not here and not there. Whereas if you have it in the development plan stages, you attract different types of people because it's about vision. It's about the next 10, 15, 20 years. Also, I think, again, with the UN Charter of the Rights of the Child, we need to bring in more young people. It wasn't just a token, yet another group. In order to raise awareness of, of young people and to be involved in a discussion, I think it is really upon us now to demonstrate that we can bring in young people and that they have a role in this democratic process. There are lots and lots of very active development trusts, amenity groups who are out there, but they're not having a such a role, but they're engaging. So, yeah, I think there's a lot more work to be done. I think uh, I managed to get one of us out of a hole there, Mr Simpson, in relation to community councils, much of which one of us got out of the hole, but I think one of us did. Uh, Andy Whiteman? Very briefly, I mean, there's um, an issue arose in my constituency where uh, an applicant wanted to demolish a building. There was widespread community opposition, unanimous rejected rejection by the council. Um, it went to appeal and the reporter approved it. Um, do you think that's fair? Without looking at the evidence, I mean, from what you had, the way you're describing it, it seems not fair because of whatever, but I think you have to look at the evidence, at exactly what is the building for, why is, so it's, it's very challenging. But that, again, touches on the role of the reporter, why and at what point are they coming in. And we, we want to have a much more front-loaded system. Much more? Front-loading of the system so that the reporter is much, much up front, yeah. not at that late stage of the adjudicator. Again, that's negative. But the reason I raised that particular issue was there's no front loading of a system where someone suddenly comes along and says, I want to demolish that building. I see it a lot in, yeah, in I, areas. I think if, if I could just say one thing, uh, it's difficult to comment in you know, one specific case like that. And, and obviously, uh, you know, no matter what the forum is, the, the, the person that made the application would expect to have a, a hearing. But uh, again, what, what we're looking uh, to try to achieve in the report would be that uh, not only uh, planning applications, but planning hearings would be taken at local level mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, at the moment the, the system can seem very remote to communities where it's taken away to Falkirk, you know, or the you know, reporters unit in Falkirk. Um, we are making recommendations about how, uh, you know, appeal, appeals or, or hearings mm -hmm. should be conducted you know, earlier, if possible, through the, the gate check system, um, but in principle, if, if they can be achieved at, uh, in the local the local area. Okay, um, Ruth McGuire. Yes, um, just thinking again about aligning um, the development planning and community planning and talk about front loading of consultation. Um, some people mentioned um, community councils being one group, and I know um, Petra, you made the point a couple of times that there's no one community. Would you agree that when we're looking at consultation, we need to find ways that communities of interest can sort of almost opt in and out so that they're not um, fixed in a single structure like a community council and that's their only way of contributing, that we do find a way to have people, you know, kind of come in and out of the process almost? Yes, and, and we, we mustn't forget that at the moment local community councils, and there are a lot of them are very, very hard working, and we work with, with almost all of them, but I think what it, what it is, they are definitely under-resourced, but they are themselves supposed to be representative of at the lowest level of democracy. So something has sadly gone wrong when they only get a couple of hundred pounds a year. So it's a lot of goodwill in some areas, a lot of goodwill depending on that. And there's only so much uh, at the current role that can do. So I don't think, I don't think currently th that system works very well. But I totally agree that where, when they are becoming more totally representative of their community, then they should almost like be required and asked for community of interest to come forward. We know, for example, there's a big food growing um, 
crisis in some areas, and there's a lot of allotment holders who want to be more involved, who want to see more allotments being created equally. At the same time, we see much more uh, hydropower schemes coming forward. Now, they're community of interest. They're not community councils, but sometimes in areas, community council will object to that scheme coming forward. So, yes, there needs to be a much broader dialogue, definitely. Thank you. Okay, do you want to follow up on that, yeah, Ruth? Thank you. Okay. Elaine, we have got time for one final question. All right, thanks, Phil. Can I maybe roll in too? It was when uh, my colleague was asking, oh, <laughs> my colleague was asking about um, the reporters' unit, and uh, I think there are issues there. But can we just clarify, though, that um, the Scottish government don't have to take that advice; that they could um, take a different advice. It could take a different decision. So that was the first thing. But secondly, um, your recommendation. 28 talks and I suppose it ties in a lot of what's been said before um, you talk about repeat applications being managed more effectively but I just wonder could you get into a wee bit more detail on how you think that could happen what could that entail yeah the legislation I think does need to, to be tightened to, to avoid you know the, the problem with with repeat applications um, that there, there is I think room uh, potentially for abuse there where uh, developers could come back time and time again and I know how wearing that is on a community when they think they have dealt with a, an application which may have you know gone through an appeal process and been refused and then suddenly you know a, a slightly different but similar application starts to, to, to run and I can understand how that would have a, a very negative effect in communities now how that would anger people. So, you know, we do think it's, it's an area that it needs to be tightened. It's probably not, you know, the most uh, uh, drastic, you know, of the recommendations. I think it, you know, it goes with a number where, you know, we do in Scotland have a quite a well-regarded, in fact, a very well-regarded planning system. Um, and that this is an area where I think that there are powers that need to be looked at to, uh, to uh, similar to the enforcement powers. No, I totally agree. I think that that's the not bear of many communities when they see an application, they may be objected, they had consultation, and then it comes back again, 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 and there needs to be something done about that. Just on the report, uh, if the community, for instance, had objected, the local government have uh, council have have refused planning, goes to an appeal and a reporter, the reporter then wants to recommend that it goes ahead. Yeah. Scottish government could actually take a different view. So. I think I think e e equal what John just said that reporter sitting somewhere else, you know that that again, it's it's not helpful for the current perception of the thank system. You. Okay, well, can all that remains now is for me to thank both of you for your attendance uh, at this morning's uh, evidence session. We've a very small amount of time left. If there's anything you feel you wanted to say today, but our questioning hasn't given you the opportunity to put it on the record. Uh, any final comments you might want to make before we close this particular session? I, I would like to, to say something, and it's about the recommendations we we make uh, about uh, the formulation of a, an infrastructure agency in Scotland. Um, I think that's a, a big handicap in the uh, planning system in Scotland, where there isn't a, a, an appropriate forum for the key agencies involved. In, uh, in the public sector in funding development to uh, basically convene around uh, development plans and the system at the moment is almost chaotic at times where you know we have different agencies who have no way of uh, consulting with each pr each other properly in the planning regime so I, th I think you know and it's why we, we did refer in the, uh, our address you know we, we appreciate there's a constraint on public spending, but you know, to really make a sort of step change in the planning system, that's an area we would have to look at either in, through an infrastructure agency or another example I could give would uh, be in England, where there's a, a homes and communities agency. We don't have an equivalent in Scotland. The nearest equivalent that we had was uh, uh, Scottish Special Housing Association or uh, Scottish Homes. Uh, they are they are now obsolete. Um, I'm not quite sure why that's that's the case, but I would see that as being a requirement for uh, you know an area to be looked at you know closely. Petra, you want I just want to, to say that the recommendations that were put forward were our recommendations that hopefully makes the system more efficient, but also much much more inclusive, 
And by front-loading it and opening it up to much more diverse groups of people, I think we can achieve quite a lot. OK, well, all that remains now is for me to thank you once again uh, for giving evidence this morning. Uh, thank you, and we'll suspend briefly for a few moments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone, uh, and good morning still, just, yes. Uh, can I welcome panel two uh, to the committee, which is Kevin Stewart, uh, our Minister for Local Government and Housing, 
and John McNearney, our chief planner. Thank you both of you for uh, coming along this morning. Um, now, uh, Minister, um, I believe you've got an opening statement for us. Uh, yes, please, uh, convener. Uh, thank you uh, and good morning. Uh, over the last year, we've had a unique opportunity to take a fresh look at the Scottish planning system. The independent panel, chaired by Crawford Beveridge, undertook a comprehensive review of the system. The review drew on extensive written and oral evidence and resulted in a positive and insightful report. The panel set out 48 recommendations for improving planning in Scotland. Our task now is to consider their findings in more detail and decide how we can change the planning system so that it delivers more for Scotland's economy and communities. The independent review covered six areas of the planning system where there is room for improvement. We have now begun work to develop a full programme of planning reform. We recognise the importance of planning and supporting inclusive growth, which enables positive change for all of Scotland's distinctive places and communities. It is too early to say exactly what future reforms might look like. However, I do have some initial thoughts on the priorities for a future white paper and wider actions. I agree that there is much to be gained from significantly streamlining development planning in Scotland. The strategic scale of planning is key to this. We will be working uh, with stakeholders over the coming weeks to explore alternative models that prioritise infrastructure delivery and providing communities with a greater say. Housing delivery is, of course, a key priority for this government, not least given our commitment to delivering 50,000 new affordable homes. Uh, the panel suggested a different approach to planning for housing, which focuses on long-term strategic planning uh, and aims to diversify delivery. We'll, we'll be exploring how this can be achieved in the coming weeks. The panel concluded that infrastructure is critical. Uh, we need to look at different approaches that better align investment in infrastructure with the areas where growth and development is happening to ensure high quality places are created for communities. The independent report also highlighted the need for improved efficiency and transparency in development management. I agree that an overhaul of development management is not required uh, as it improved significantly as a result of the 2006 Planning Act. However, uh, there is still scope for targeted improvements. I will be particularly interested to see how more applications can be removed from the planning process to free up resources. Leadership, resources and skills is a further key theme that has emerged from the report. Uh, we, begin a process of, we began a process of culture change when we introduced the 2006 Act, but this remains unfinished business. There is a need to ensure that planning authorities are adequately resourced, as well as a continuing emphasis on improving performance. Finally, I believe that the community empowerment in the planning process must be central to the future of planning reform. We need to ensure that communities and individual members of the public understand, trust and actively participate in planning if we want to get the most out of the system. Uh, we'll be exploring all of these issues with a wide range of stakeholders in the coming months. We will set out a range of options and ideas in a white paper, uh, and I expect further open and inclusive debate on the issues following its publication. The review panel found innovative examples from around the country where planning makes a positive contribution, but they were tasked with focusing on where the system is not realising its potential. I believe we are on the cusp of realising the full potential of planning to create great places for all of Scotland's people and that we should grasp and take that opportunity. Uh, I am happy to hear your views uh, and answer your questions on our own ongoing programme of work on planning reform. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, we're, we're grateful for that statement. Uh, could we perhaps start where we left off in the last session where Mr Hamilton put on record uh, as part of the, the independent review group that one of the recommendations he wanted to draw to our attention was the need for a, a national infrastructure agency or even something potentially lo looking about what, what I believe is a kind of homes and communities agency in England. Uh, the, the picture was painted that there's a lot of 
good efforts taking place in the development and planning process in local authorities and across Scotland. It's not always focused and they're not always talking to each other. And the idea of a national infrastructure agency would be would be beneficial. I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit in relation to that. Um, obviously, convener, um, as I've said, we're at the very beginning of a process um, and we are going to talk to stakeholders about all uh, of the recommendations um, that have been put forward. Um, I'm aware um, of the English situation um, and I'm also aware of some of the difficulties um, that have arisen um, from uh, what they have uh, established there. Um, and, you know, one of the things which I, I would be wanting to ensure if we moved along that line um, is that we would not make um, the same mistakes. I'll bring in um, uh, Mr McNerney um, in terms of some of the engagement that we've already had around about this and where we intend to, to go in, in, in the f next few weeks. Okay. Um, thanks, Minister, uh, Convener. Um, we've let six research um, projects to support the outcome of the planning review, and one of those is, is about infrastructure, charging, learning from experience elsewhere, um, particularly around SIL, south of the border. I think we recognise that the funding of infrastructure um, over the last decade or more has become um, a real challenge for delivery. Um, and this is a, a good time to build on the recommendations um, and try and learn how we can join up and use um, what uh, finance is available more effectively. Um, so the working groups, which um, start on Monday and Tuesday, include a group of experts on infrastructure and we'll be, we'll be taking some of these questions to them um, as the start of an engagement process uh, around infrastructure, but the other six themes as well. I think one of the other things, um, Convener, because you did mention um, the, the English system, uh, one of the major uh, criticisms that there have been uh, about that system is that it's overly complex uh, and it's only suited to market conditions in the southeast of England and in particular around about London. Um, so obviously that's one of the things that we'll look at but we also have to be aware um, that there has been criticism uh, of that what has been deemed by some to be an overly complex system. That's helpful. I know one of the things that was suggested in, in, in the review in relation to funding infrastructure was the idea of a, an infrastructure levy eh, on, on, on developers, potentially. And I would set that beside um, Section 75 eh, agreements, which I know have declined and are not as useful as they used to be, and also perhaps add that they've not always been used for the intent, intended purposes. The discussion we had earlier was, was quite often around that as a a way for communities sometimes to buy into development to get some form of local community benefit, which is not necessarily the purpose of a Section 75 agreement, but there could be some concerns that there's there's perhaps some tensions there because any money should, that is taken for national infrastructure may further undermine Section 75 agreements, and whether they're actually now being used for their initial purpose or not is, is a moot point also. So just maybe some early thinking about where Section 75 agreements sit beside a, an infrastructure levy and how we get community benefit within within developments at the early stage also? Well, Section 75 agreements were never about additional benefit. I think that you said that yourself there. Um, it is to ensure um, that the infrastructure is there. And as I've um, gone uh, about the country during the course um, of the summer, um, I've uh, been asking some of the folk that have come across various questions round about Section 75. Um, and obviously, you would uh, well imagine, um, developers are often not particularly happy um, about having to pay for um, new schools, for example. Um, uh, the other um, side of the coin is that some communities um, feel that their local authority is not making best use of the current Section 75 arrangements. Um, Mr uh, McNerney will correct me here, but two councils were responsible for what percentage of Section 75s? Um, 36. 36% 36 uh, of Section 75 um, agreements. Now, you know, one of the things which I need to get 
um, uh, knowledge of is why is it that certain folk are making that much use of Section 75 and others are not. Um, this is one of the areas um, which is of great interest to me in terms of what the stakeholders come up with. Um, as Mr McNerney says, um, we have the um, workshops uh, over next Monday and Tuesday. They are really important to us in terms um, of our engagement um, and getting the knowledge of what's going on out there. Prior to that, um, I had um, a, a number of round table events uh, with various parties in between the public uh, publication of the report and um, the um, uh, government's response. Now, I think that in terms of uh, the information that we gather, that in itself will help guide us to where we need to go um, in terms of, of some of these issues. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. Would it be reasonable to suggest, and without presupposing what the working groups will, what, what will take forward, that if Section 75 agreements are not always been used for what they were initially intended for, and there's discussion about an infrastructure levy, there may also be discussions for about what community benefit would look like and whether a Section 75 is not the most appropriate vehicle for that. And community benefit may not necessarily be about infrastructure, but community empowerment, that that's something that could be discussed about teasing out how you co-produce with community benefit from the early stages within, within developments. I'm sure that these issues will come up at the workshops um, next week because um, we have community representations uh, at those uh, at those workshops so obviously um, we are keen to hear um, what communities views are um, on the current arrangements um, and the proposals uh, that have been put forward by the independent panel just finally in relation to the six working groups that are being established or have been established, the workshops you talk about are different from the working groups, is that correct, no, Minister? No, the, the working groups uh, will be taking part in these workshops on Monday and Tuesday. So it would be helpful whether uh, just now or if you could perhaps write to us, if you don't have the information at hand, about uh, who were invited to sit on the working groups. I know we've got an open petition from Planning Democracy before us and, what, and they have written to myself asking about uh, how we make sure... Uh, individual members or very localised community organisations can be represented on some of these working groups and uh, it's not for me to say who should or shouldn't be on them but I suspect that was an appeal from planning democracy to be involved I would imagine. Um, uh, convener, um, there are well over a hundred invitees. I signed uh, all of the letters personally because I wanted to see um, exactly uh, who was uh, coming to the event and to make sure that it was uh, as diverse um, and representative as possible. Uh, Planning Democracy have been invited um, to the uh, event next week, um, uh, as have a number of other community organisations too. Um, I will get um, officials to write to you with all of those folks who um, were invited. Uh, but beyond that, I believe that all of the attendees will appear on the website at the beginning of next week. Am I right, Mr. McNerney? Yeah. yeah. That's very helpful, and it's not for our committee to make a plea for one organisation over another. It merely they had made representations to the committee, hence why they were name checked with, within uh, within this morning's evidence session. But can I just check separately from that? There are working groups whose work will be ongoing, and those working groups are hosting workshops next week. And I suppose what I'm interested in is who sits on the working group rather than who's going to the workshops, which are two separate things. I've maybe confused things a little bit, convener. I'll let Mr McNerney explain. OK. Um, invitations went out for a range of people to be part of the working groups. Um, and the workshops next week are an opportunity for them to come together. So the six working groups will meet in plenary, they'll also drive forward answers to some of the key review questions and we'll publish um, an overview of uh, how those workshops have gone. Um, there'll also be an online discussion um, platform between now and the publication of a white paper, which we intend uh, to be around December. Okay. That's really helpful. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr Gibson? Yes, thank you. Very much, uh, Convener. I want, just want to focus on kind of housing, if that's OK, yes. Convener. And one, one of the areas I want to uh, uh, talk to you about is the issue of um, simplified planning zones. Um, 
Now, you've said in the kind of the, the ten recommendations that you're moving forward immediately that uh, you'll take forward a pilot of simplified planning zones for housing. I'm just wondering if you can explain a wee bit more about what a simplified planning zone is, uh, how they'll work, and uh, where the um, the pilot is likely to take place and when it's likely to get up and running. Okay, thank you um, for that. Um, we'll progress uh, pilot si simplified planning zones for housing as a priority convener. Um, we don't yet know where these pilots will be at the moment, uh, but work, we'll work with uh, planning authorities to identify suitable candidates. Currently, there are only uh, arrangements for two SPZs in Scotland, that's Hillington Business Park um, and Renfrew Town Centres. Um, and, you know, we believe that simplified planning zones offer uh, an adaptable approach uh, to the delivery of high quality housing and to make areas investment ready. Um, the front loading of site assessments, site briefs and, and master planning uh, would allow for early and effective community engagement at the beginning of the development process, uh, while supporting placemaking in a holistic way. And I put the emphasis on the uh, placemaking there, which I think is really important. Uh, SPZs uh, could uh, assist uh, by embedding an infrastru infrastructure first approach development and encourage greater innovation uh, in the delivery models. So we're currently putting in place all these plans to pilot SPZs for housing. Uh, we'll examine uh, a lot of these issues more when uh, we're actually in practice. I'm afraid, as I said, I cannot tell the committee at this moment in time where these pilots are, are likely to take place as yet. Um, but as soon as I have that information, um, I will uh, certainly share that with the committee. I don't know if Mr McNerney wants to add to anyth um, anything there. A couple of points, mainly about what they do. Uh, a simplified planning zone would remove the need for full planning permission. Um, so there would be, as the Minister says, a front-loaded process um, around defining what area might be subject of a simplified planning zone, the planning authority would do that. Um, I, I think that we will ask for interest from planning authorities and work with them in, in taking that forward. Um, there are some restrictions that a simplified planning zone um, currently wouldn't apply to areas that are protected under habitats, for example. Um, we would need to look at requirements for environmental assessment and community involvement. But once that's in place, um, it would be for developers to then to build. There might be um, a design brief, but you wouldn't need to go through the planning process. So it would remove the need for planning permission. There would still be a need for, say, a building warrant, um, but working with the planning authority, we would hope to align any other consents so that it's a much more straightforward route to getting on site. Uh, in terms of uh, the report itself, in paragraph 4, uh, 15, it says uh, uh, that uh, some communities are not receptive to new housing development, and this is exacerbated where infrastructure is already under pressure. Now, obviously, there's an issue about improving infrastructure, and I think that's something uh, we all want to look at. I mean, I, I had a meeting with the Chief Executive of the Ayrshire Land Health Board, and he expressed concern that the planning system, for example, doesn't really involve the the health uh, board, you know, so for example, uh, there could be a proposal to build uh, several hundred new houses and yet there doesn't seem to be any interaction with the local GP practice to see whether or not they will be able to, for example, have the space to take on additional uh, uh, medical staff or whatever. So I'm just wondering if that's uh, an area that you're actually looking at. And is, the, is the, the issue of the simplified planning zones a way of trying to um, square the circle of trying to ensure that housing is provided even though the communities might not be receptive or is that part of the kind of front loading exercise? I'm just wondering how all of this kind of ties in together. I think what you have asked in those questions has uh, brought bits of the jigsaw which maybe are not all together at this moment in time and how we bring all of those pieces of the jigsaw together to make the planning system much simpler and easier and to take account um, of uh, varied um, views. Um, let me start off with um, uh, your question around about no consultation um, with the health service in, in terms of um, 
uh, some or, or aspects of the the planning system, and I've I've come across that within my own constituency um, as well at points, um, Mr. Gibson. I think what we need to do, and this is our great opportunity, um, is to make sure that everybody uh, who needs and should be engaged in the planning system is engaged in that system. Um, so we have the opportunity, I think, here um, to look at all of these issues, which um, I think, in fairness, largely in the past have been a little bit put to one side. So I would hope that in, in terms of what we're doing in terms of the engagement, um, but also in terms of the um, formulation of the white paper, um, that we will look at engagement a lot more to make sure um, that you know we have the uh, the right uh, infrastructure to support development in a particular area. Um, beyond that, you know there have been various suggestions made uh, about how. Um, maybe um, we deal with some uh, of the infrastructure questions that are often put. Um, you know, one of the things which um, uh, has been suggested, uh, rather than upfront contribution um, at a certain point, uh, what we should look at is maybe uh, trying to facilitate um, loan investment from government or other agencies to do whatever is required and then recoup um, that money back at a later date. I'm willing to, to look at all of these things. Um, there have been a huge number of suggestions in terms of the recommendations um, from um, the independent uh, panel's report itself. But since then, in terms of stakeholders, a number of, uh, of other issues have come up, which you know um, we will consider and look at uh, and will obviously be discussed in greater depth over the course of next Monday and Tuesday. And just finally, Convener, um, on the issue of regional housing targets, you made a call on the 29th of June, I asked you about the 10,000 a year affordable houses and how they'd be distributed, and you said uh, there would really be demand-led, so it would be based on housing proposals being put forward in specific local authorities. I'm just wondering how that ties in with this regional housing target, because if it's going to be demand-led from uh, you know, developers or local authorities working together in certain areas to put forward proposals, uh, how does that, you know, the regional... Um, uh, housing target seems to almost contradict that by almost having a kind of a, a top-down approach. And also, I was trying to tease out from the previous panel what they meant by regional targets, and I wasn't, I didn't feel I got a, a, a kind of um, very clear answer to that question. Mr. Hamilton is smiling in the in the background, but I really think we need to be to be able to define what we're actually talking about here if we're going to take this forward. Well, as Mr. Gibson is well aware, convener, um, local authorities uh, currently have housing needs assessments and they decide um, where um, they are going to um, target resource um, to, um, to deliver uh, the uh, affordable housing that, um, that they require. Um, however, all of that normally feeds in um, to the strategic development plan as well. And sometimes those things are not entirely in sync um, now, I, 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 I kind of speak for the panel. I think that maybe what they were trying to get at was to try and get all of this in sync. But as far, um, uh, uh, as, far as it goes at this moment, um, you know, it's local authorities that look at those um, housing needs assessments. That's uh, where we develop um, what investment we are, are putting in uh, in a local area. Um, as I say, I can't speak for the panel and what they thought about that, but I assume, I'm assuming that it is something to do with sometimes a lack of linkage between housing numbers and the local development plan and the strategic development plan. Mr. McNerney. Um, I, I make an assumption here as well, but I, I read that recommendation as part of a, a simplifying of the landscape of, of plans. Um, in this instance around strategic development plans. Um, and if targets were um, more visible in a national planning framework, um, then there would be that, that tighter alignment between a national planning framework and what's provided in local development plans. 
And I think one of the issues just now around um, strategic development plans, um, although we, we support strategic planning, um, is that plans uh, commence at, at various different dates. Um, so it's quite complicated. So it's, a, it's around being clearer. Now, on the issue of um, what, what would the regional area be, I think that's what you were, you were probing earlier. Um, well, on the face of it, it might be the, the area that was the city, re the four city regions. But of course, there are other uh, parts of the country, from Highland to to the Ayrshires, um, who would also look for a steer. One might think, and so that's exactly the kind of thing that we would look for the working groups to discuss and uh, and propose some options around. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, um, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, um, and good morning, Minister. Still is morning. Um, in your opening statement, you mentioned the importance of community empowerment involvement with stakeholders, which uh, I think we would all agree that that's an important issue. But I think, unfortunately, um, we, we've kind of heard some evidence about the third party or equal right of appeal, and we have a petition ongoing at the moment on this issue. So... Given that that is an issue, um, and, and actually it's quite supported among certain parts of the civic sector and, and parts of the policy and planning sectors, I just wonder why um, you've come to the conclusion you've come to under immediate actions number nine, where you're saying that in, in line with the panel's recommendation, you don't intend to introduce a third party or equal right of appeal. Now, the reason I ask is that there wasn't any specific questions when the panel were, were calling for evidence on the issue. But of those people who did mention it, 70%, as I put to the panel, did actually agree with some kind of equal right of appeal, um, or at least an examination of it. So I just wonder why you you don't... Um, basically, it looks like it's, the debate's been a bit closed down on this, Minister, so maybe you could just give us a bit of an explanation around that. Um, I think that the key thing in all of this, and this is where I agree with the panel, is to make sure um, that at the very start um, communities are involved in the planning process. Um, and I think if that happens, um, then we we see um, some of the areas of tension being ironed out quite quickly. Um, let me give you two examples, um, convener. Uh, during the course of the summer, I was um, in Ardrossan and Mr Gibson's constituency. Um, and Cunningham Housing Association um, are building 70 units uh, there. Um, and I broke the ground um, at that development. And there was a huge number of members of the community there um, who were engaged at the very start of the process. Um, who obviously, as is always the case, some folk are, are not happy about various things. Um, but in terms of the engagement there, um, you know, those difficulties were ironed out. So you've got a happy community um, and, um, you know, um, they, they, can, they can proceed. Um, and a similar scenario um, this week in Aberdeen um, at Craig Inch's prison, which will have 124 affordable homes for key workers. Um, the community council there and residents um, were not happy about um, the sighting of one of the buildings. Early engagement uh, meant that Sanctuary Housing Association, who um, are uh, building that development, um, actually moved, uh, agreed to move one of those buildings um, to, su to suit um, the, the community uh, and local residents. Now, I think that, you know, in terms of these early engagements, it's good for all. Um, and I think in in terms of some of the difficulties that there have been in the past, it is because there has not been enough engagement with communities or not the right engagement with communities. And I think as we move on um, with technology um, and, the, uh, and the panel highlighted this, you know, we've got the scenario of, uh, of being able to do 3D visualizations. You could have a walkthrough of a development that's, uh, that's not even there. You know, you, could, you can put it in place with the current features are, that are there. Um, 
it's difficult, I think, for some people to look at a, a plan and a bit of paper. It's difficult for me to look at a, bit of, a, a plan and a bit of paper and envisage exactly what's going to happen there. These opportunities are huge. And getting communities on board early with their ideas can iron out tensions at an early stage. But let me come back to the point of um, third party appeal itself. Um, you're right, the, um, our response uh, confirms the consistent line by um, government, which has been held for a number of years, um, that we agree with the panel's recommendations uh, and we don't intend to introduce uh, a third party or equal right of appeal. And we will, uh, will definitely focus on more effective methods of engaging people at that earlier stage. Um, is Ms. Smith is well aware, uh, she's been here uh, since the beginning, uh, the introduction uh, of a third party right of appeal on the planning system has been considered in this place on a number of occasions. Um, in advance of the previous planning bill in 2004, um, the then Scottish executive undertook a full public consultation on the introduction of third party right of appeal. The issue was also um, considered by Jeremy Rowan Robinson in his paper Options for Change, and, and which were published in, in 2003. Um, and you know, at every stage, the, 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 the Parliament has said no. Thanks very much for that, Minister. But I suppose the, the question is more about you, you've made this decision in line with the panel's recommendation, and I don't understand specifically what evidence it was based on since they didn't call for evidence on the issue for people to input to. That wasn't a specific question. And if um, front-loading, wh which I certainly hope it would be, I think we'd all want to avoid conflict, but if you're confident that that's going to be the way forward, then um, a point that my colleague Graeme Simpson asked of the, pa the, the panel earlier, why then have any right of appeal? So that I can just put that there for a moment. Um, but secondly as well, the, the evidence that has been um, taken on it, the only evidence that seems to have been researched on it is Professor Ellis from Belfast University. And actually, um, he gave a quote to the Petitions Committee, which, if I might just quote, said, in the context of the Irish planning system, extended rights of appeal played an important and valued role. They were accepted and welcomed by a wide range of parties, and there was very limited evidence of abuse. So that seemed to kind of put to bed the, the, the NIMBY fears that made them rather unfounded. So I, I suppose really what people are are concerned about is that it does seem to just have been shut down rather than um, being part of a wider consultation. 2004 was a long time ago. I, I can't recall, despite, I mean, maybe because I've been here too long, I can't recall the exact um, outcome of the public consultation at that time. Did the public overwhelmingly want a right of appeal? I do know that several members toyed with the idea of private members' bills over the years, but I'm not sitting here advocating one way or another. I'm just trying to tease out why... Um, you know, it, it looks as if it might just have been closed as, as, as part of the debate. For instance, will it be discussed next week? Um, convener, uh, Ms Smith, I think, is playing devil's advocate a little bit, which I, I do myself um, from time to time. First of all, um, I think it would be fair to say um, that the panel got a, a fair amount of views about um, third party right of appeal. And if I can maybe play devil's advocate a little bit as well, um, the question that I would ask was, would be, why would you engage at the start um, of the planning process if your intention is just going to be to object at the end, come what may? You know, that's, that's me being devil's, devil's advocate in a way as well. And if I can, if I can go further, and I'm not aware of the professor's work, but I will, I will look at that. Um, some of the arguments that I've seen about um, the system in Ireland is um, an accusation by many that it is a centralisation of the planning process, um, and I would much prefer um, if decisions were in the main taken at local level. Um, with the level of community engagement that is that is um, required. Um, the other thing about, um, and again, I'm playing devil's advocate. Um, we've probably all come across somebody at some point um, in councils or in parliament, um, somebody who 
has basically told us that they're going to object to every single thing that is put forward in their neighbourhood. How do we deal with that kind of vexatious situation where there might be appeal after appeal after appeal after appeal? And I'll bring in Mr McNerney. OK. Um, well, just to add very briefly to that, our systems are different. So um, in Scotland, for example, we've, we've tended to have um, quite full examinations of the development plan. So that's, that's quite early in the process, where public have an opportunity to make comment on the plans. Um, and also pre-application discussion around major developments where they have an opportunity. Now, the 2006 um, proposals did seek to front load um, community engagement. Um, again, actually, to try and reduce the fact that people were unhappy at the end of the process and to try and um, respond to arguments for third party right of appeal. Now, it, it's clear that those from the, the review panel's findings um, can be built on and we can go much further. Um, but the aspiration is for people to take ownership of the development plan. It's a development plan that has the force of law at the end of the day. Um, and one of the, the things that the panel were asked about was exactly how we can collaborate more with communities. So, I mean, there wasn't a specific question on third party rights of appeal, but um, we, we did ask, do we need to change the system to ensure everyone has a fair hearing and plan and decision making, which, which is in that territory of um, fairness and um, trying to avoid that communities feel planning is something that's done to them. But the other key ingredient here is around the impact on how the system works overall. Um, would a third party right of appeal um, streamline the system or would it make it more bureaucratic? Would it make the outcome more unpredictable? Um, would it make it more unlikely that people would invest in Scotland when in other administrations they don't have a third party right of appeal? And so that whole thing about growth, particularly at this point um, in the economy, is something that um, would be in sharp focus around third party right of appeal. Now, I've got Andy, sorry, Andy, I've got Graham Simpson on a supplementary in, in relation to this. But then after that, Graham, you had indicated you also wanted to ask about shared services. Maybe an opportunity for you to ask that supplementary to move the conversation on. Yeah, th thanks, convener, because I, I don't want to get bogged down with uh, this issue, but uh, you did play devil's advocate, so uh, if I could uh, sort of turn your point uh, on its head. Um, if we're going to involve um, communities uh, right, right from the start of the planning process, um, you said, why would you then allow them to ap appeal? I think that's what you said. Um, you could also say that about developers, couldn't you? Um, I think what we have is we have a, a system uh, which uh, the right of appeal uh, harks back to 1947 um, to ensure that any denial of what had previously been a right to develop had appropriate scrutiny. Um, I think, you know, um, what we have here is the opportunity in terms of public engagement to make um, a huge amount of change um, and to um, involve uh, as many folk in the process as possible. Um, and not just in terms of a single application, um, but in every single aspect of, of the process itself. And I think that if we do that, if we front load the system, uh, to ensure that there is the level of engagement that I would like to see, which follows through in the government's empowerment agenda and other areas, um, then uh, we will create a, a much uh, better um, outcome uh, f for, for, for all, uh, in my opinion. My, uh, I mean, in terms of the appeal um, scenario, um, and I am not an expert on the Irish system. But there is that accusation of centralisation. Um, and what has, has been said previously is, you know, um, about reporters. Why is it that um, reporters have decisions? Or why is it that, that I ultimately um, may have a decision? Um, because they don't know anything about a local area. Um, or I don't know anything about a local area. 
what we would have if we introduced third party right of appeal um, is, I think, a much more bureaucratic system, um, a much more centralised system. Um, and as has rightly been pointed out, a system um, that would not be fit um, to deal um, with the current situations that we face um, uh, in terms of um, the difficulties that may occur in terms of economic de development if Brexit goes ahead. And if we have a system which is um, very, very much different from elsewhere um, in these islands, it may well be um, that folk choose to invest elsewhere. Um, which is uh, would be a, a particularly difficult situation, um, in in my opinion. Now, I do think that the best way of dealing with this is at the early stages. I've given you examples um, where you know that if engagement is done right, you can take communities with you, um, and I think that that is the way that we should go. Not just in single applications, but on every single aspect of the system. Mr McNair, do you want to add anything? Um, the, well, the only other thing I think I would add is that since the 2006 Act, um, practice around engagement has drastically improved, and it's more common now for communities to use the charrette process or other engagement techniques. The place standards being taken up across the country um, as a good method to have conversations with communities about what's important to them. I think um, we need to do a lot more uh, around aligning community planning and spatial planning. Um, but if we can do that, it's all part of getting a stronger collaboration about what people feel are the important things that need to change in their areas. Okay. Um, Andy, is it on community planning you want to come in, is it in this area? Just briefly, a follow up on, on this convener. Um, it was Section 14 of the 47 Act that gave the right to appeal, and I think one of the questions we're going to be grappling with is precisely um, that if the system is better front-loaded, there's more engagement early on, the plans are clearer, there's more consent, there's more buy-in, that does in fact undermine the case for having any right of appeal for any party, and that um, at the end of the day, if at least we can equalise the rights, as it were, I'm not talking about introducing an equal right of appeal, but equalise the rights, um, that might get somewhere close to persuading those who remain to be persuaded that the system is going to deliver better upfront planning and consultation. I think one of the things, convener here, um, is that delay and uncertainty uh, for both um, the public and the private sector um, uh, we're, we're criticised, um, the, the system is criticised already as being slow and unresponsive. Um, with the further rights of appeal, uh, with the third right of appeal, it could be abused even more um, through unjustified opposition to development proposals intended to serve the wider public, public interest. Um, and the thing is that there's already a situation um, where people have the ability um, to go to ju judicial review in a point of law. So that exists. And if, if, if I look at my own home patch, um, you know, where um, the Western Peripheral Route, uh, the Aberdeen Bypass, which was first envisaged in 1948, um, hugely backed by the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of the people uh, of the northeast of Scotland. Um, it was delayed um, again and again and again because uh, of court processes. Now, I think that we would probably enter such situations on a much more regular basis if third party right of appeal was introduced. Uh, things would then end up at the reporters, which already some folk say is centralisation, and then possibly end up in my and desk. Not, yeah, because uh, I do want to move on from this because there are a whole range of issues I want us to discuss. Um, but just for clarity, I think Mr. Whiteman was talking about if we get the front loading correct 
or improve it? Is there a rationale for diluting a developer's right of appeals? I think is, is, is what he was asking. And I don't want to, to dwell on that. I really do want to move on, but I think that was the core of what Mr Whiteman was asking. I don't think we heard anything about your views on that. OK. Uh, first of all, I'll take in Mr McNerney because he wants to make a point, and then I'll come to that. OK. Well, just very briefly, the 1947 situation was essentially that uh, a landowner w was no longer free to, to dispose of his property as he saw fit and had to seek permission. Um, and th that's the context for um, being able to appeal against the decision that they were aggrieved about. But the current, the current situation is not just landowner versus um, uh, an aggrieved community. Um, there's also the role of the local authority. So um, an applicant for planning permission needs to approach the local authority and decisions are taken by um, members generally who are, who are um, elected to take those decisions. And so if there's a decision that's contrary to the development plan, it's a major development, the full council would take a, a, a decision on that. So there is a, a, a democratic um, element to this as well, um, all of which really is built on the initial engagement, the strength of the plan, um, and then the member involvement in that decision. I think th the other thing in terms of um, the dilution scenario, if um, we have gone through, uh, and most of this is around about individual applications, but if we've gone through the scenario of um, designating something in the local development plan, or maybe um, even in the um, national planning framework, um, you know, and all of that is in there, but it's the individual application that for whatever reason may be rejected at a local level, then there's the argument about why can you not appeal that when it is in the local development plan or it is in the national planning framework, you know. And I think sometimes in, in terms of planning as a whole, um, people focus uh, on that individual application. What I hope that we can do is engage much more members of the public not just about those individual applications, but about planning as a whole um, in their area. Um, and I think that at that point, you know, we may get rid uh, of, of some of the tensions that currently exist. And we're not going to ask any more questions on third party right, right, of, right of appeal, but that was quite a helpful clarification, Minister, because that was a very clear answer to the question of dilution of developers' right of appeal, so I'm grateful for you putting that on the record. Mr Simpson, do you want to come back and ask about shared services? or Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask about shared services and, and uh, uh, another matter as well, because I think it, it's all related to the effectiveness of... Um, local authority planning departments. Um, you know, we're well aware that uh, many of them are, well, struggling, frankly, um, for for money. Um, so I wonder, perhaps you can give us your thoughts on what you mean by shared services, what services you're thinking of, um, and if you can also touch on uh, planning fees. Um, uh, and tell us your thoughts on that. Um, why shouldn't uh, individual councils be able to set their own fees? Um, and would you be minded to allow for charging for pre-application advice, for, for example? I don't think that's mentioned anywhere. OK. Um, in terms of um, shared services, Convener, when I was previously uh, before the committee, uh, at the beginning of this term, I talked about the exporting of best practice right across the country, um, which I probably harp on about far too much. But I think, you know, um, we need to ensure that we do export um, best practice. Beyond that, there is also the ability um, to share the experts. Um, you know, there may be planning authorities which have uh, an application, an unusual application for their patch, and they don't have the expertise um, around about that particular area. Um, so why not um, actually uh, share that expertise um, right across the country? Um, there should be no difficulty in doing so, um, as, as far as I am concerned. Um, in terms of, of fees, 
Um, obviously, uh, I think that fees will be uh, one of the major uh, planks of discussion uh, next next week. Um, I think that um, you know there are many folks um, who who feel um, that um, fees should rise, uh, including uh, a number of folk in the development industry it itself. Um, but, you know, I think that what we will have to look at is if we um, choose um, to increase fees, um, that we also ensure um, that productivity um, rises too. Um, these will, I'm quite sure, um, form uh, a major part of the discussion um, next uh, Monday uh, and Tuesday, without a doubt. Uh, Mr. McNerney. Um, on sharing um, services or skills, that, I mean, I think it varies across the country, but al already planning authorities share some specialist staff um, that they maybe don't have in-house. Um, it's really for consideration with, with planning authorities and with COSLA as well, the extent to which they want to take that further. Um, obviously, there is potential to have much more in terms of shared services. Um, in terms of the planning fee, um, the fee in Scotland is significantly lower than in other administrations at just over £20,000. As the Minister says, um, there'll be interest in us um, consulting on how that situation might change. Um. Minister, did Mr Simpson get a chance to follow up in a second? Minister, do you want to add something there? Um, what, what I was going to uh, say is... Um, convener that we've already confirmed that we'll consult on enhanced fees um, as one of those early actions. It will be one of these things which will be up for um, discussion next week without a doubt. Um, but, you know, in terms of um, uh, enhancing um, fees, that also has to lead to improvements in performance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Simpson, did you follow up on that? Yeah. Um so, so going back to shared services, um, councils already talk to each other. Um, they share, they do share best practice. That's going on uh, right now. Um, are, are, you, are you thinking of um, forcing shared services on onto councils, or will you just leave, will you leave it to them? And if you're going to leave it to them, why do anything? I'm not in the business of forcing uh, people into doing things, um, but I think that what we should be looking at, that what council should be looking at, um, is um, what can they do um, in terms of enhancing the services that they provide uh, by sharing expertise, which may actually be people, uh, to provide that improved service that is required. Now, um, Heads of Planning Scotland um, are key stakeholders um, in uh, what we're embarking on. Um, they um, are aware, uh, I'm quite sure, um, that there could be better use of personnel if there was some sharing um, going on. Now, again, um, uh, I'm sure this will feature very highly in terms of the discussions that take place um, uh, at, at next week. I would much rather, as I've said before, use the carrot um, and try and encourage folk to do these things rather than the stick um, and, and enforcing um, them to do these things. Uh, I have to say that there has been pretty positive um, uh, noises from the Heads of Planning Scotland uh, about the Independence Panel's report as a whole, and I think that there's a recognition um, that, you know, um, there could be uh, much more sharing of expertise. I just think in terms of that, Minister, and I, I couldn't be getting the, the review wrong, I think the, the previous committee I sat on of local government in 2007, their Birthnot review was published with great fanfare, which I think was Glasgow and the Clyde Valley Review for Sharing Services. I could have got the name wrong, but I think we're still waiting for any action points to be taken forward on that. So just because local authorities are up for it doesn't necessarily mean you'll you'll ever see any any change. I, I just 
We are seeing a change in many areas of shared services. Um, I, I've given the example before um, where, where you're sat now, from where you're sat now rather than this side, um, about Aberdeen City and Shire's joint procurement unit. Um, and the best practice of sharing services there, and the amount of money that saved the public purse, which has been able, which money which has been invested um, uh, in public services. Now we can see that uh, others are now looking at some of these things. Highland are now about to join Aberdeen City and Shire. I think others are considering. Um, I I believe that we are seeing a sea change in terms of attitudes towards shared services um, and uh, you know I think that it's one uh, of the areas which I had great interest in uh, when I was on this committee uh, and one which I will continue to keep a close eye on as minister uh, and as I go around the country uh, I've been encouraging folk to look uh, very carefully uh, it in terms of what they can do in terms of shared services not necessarily with their next door neighbour because it doesn't have to be geographical um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be um, with other local authorities we're drifting away from planning a bit here convener uh, it could be with other public bodies too um, but you know I think that folk are beginning to realise that shared services is a way forward in order to save the public purse and to allow for more of the investment in public services services in tough times. Mr Whiteman will get his back on track but can just because you've, you've already asked a question already is it on shared services or fees because I should still take uh, Mr Stewart in then who hasn't asked a question yet this session. Alexander. Okay thank you Minister. The report indicates and there's no doubt that there has to be serious changes and significant changes within the planning process so that we can ensure uh, that it's much more positive because at the present moment it, there's a lot of negativity around the whole planning issue uh, and many communities and authorities have to deal with that. Uh, so to try and get from the situation where it's a, a problem uh, and it's, it's a, uh, not a positive situation to getting into a positive situation, uh, the, the whole workload and the whole number of applications that many authorities have to manage means that they require more funding and more resource. Uh, and if we're going to achieve that, uh, then we have to look at some of the areas that you've already touched on today. Uh, and I think that's vitally important. But the biggest issue, and I, and I asked uh, uh, the panel earlier before you arrived, was about the whole enforcement of planning and how that can be managed and how that can be uh, evolved. Because if we, can, if we can manage to crack that nut in some way, we, we may manage to make a much more positive contribution. So I'd like your views on that. I think that um, you raise a, a very good point. Uh, um, from my own perspective, there have been points um, where enforcement, or in some cases, lack of enforcement, um, has caused me um, some troubles over my uh, years uh, on a council. Um, one of the things which um, I, I've already said that we will look at um, is are the penalties um, severe enough uh, in these regards. It would be better if people didn't do naughty things in the first place, let's be honest with you. Are the penalties severe enough um, uh, to, to try and stop uh, some of the things that have gone uh, on? And um, we will look at that very closely um, because at this moment in time, um, looking at it, I don't know if penalties themselves uh, would put folk off um, doing certain things in certain areas. Uh, I think we have to get to a point where, uh, in this case, uh, we probably need to apply more of the stick. I would agree. The stick is much needed in this process because you've, 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 you've touched on it, that there's no question that some developers see uh, you know, a knocking down of a few trees uh, and a few thousand pounds that they, they would be charged for that uh, as uh, peanuts in comparison to what they could make uh, in a development uh, that may well uh, progress thereafter. So yes, I, I look forward to seeing what comes forward, Minister, and that we can also make a contribution on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms Maguire. Um, we've heard this morning, um, Minister, about how um, improving planning can help with sort of all manner of things, community engagement and empowerment. Um, but I just wondered um, what your opinion was in terms of the extent 
of the problems in housing delivery, how much of that is down to planning and, and how much is down to, to kind of other factors? Um, one of the things about the job that I've got at this moment in time is I'm trying to get all of the ducks in a row um, to ensure um, that we deliver on the government's 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliament. Um, I think that there are difficulties um, with planning, but there are also uh, other difficulties in terms of um, some of the utilities, um, in terms of land, um, and a number of other things. Uh, I think that planning itself um, does cause um, some difficulties, um, but um, you know it is not the only thing by a long shot. In terms of what you're talking about, in, in terms of communities in place, uh, I think you know planning itself um, has a great role to play um, in what we are embarking on here. Um, Mr. Stewart talked uh, about sometimes there are not many positives. But in terms of placemaking itself, um, to create um, the right environments, it's not. I mean, what we're what we're doing is we're not um, uh, embarking on um, uh, fifty thousand houses without thinking about place as well. Um, in terms of some of the things that I've seen of late, convener, with good planning. Um, with good project management um, and with community input, we are seeing some of the best um, places that I've seen for a fair while. Um, I'll give you an example, convener, in terms of Fernan Gardens, um, a Shet Austin housing um, development um, in the east end of Glasgow, um, where everything I think has come together in in that um, little community. Um, the planning is right, the design is right, the place is fantastic. You've got a lot of happy people there, and if folk are happy, um, you know that often uh, resolves other difficulties that that we may have to deal with um, uh, from a public. Uh, public service perspective. So, um, you know, I think in terms of all of that we are about to do here, one of the things which we cannot lose sight of um, is that this is all about placemaking and creating um, the right communities that folk want to live in and can be happy in. Can I say to members, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left for questioning. Ruth, did you want to come back on, thank on you. that? Can I take Andy Whiteman to followed by Elaine Smith? Okay, just a very, thank you. Can we, just a couple of very brief questions on process. Um, in your um, response to the panel's review, you said, as the panel have thoroughly considered the evidence, we do not intend to reopen the debate on what should be done. Um, I just wish, wonder if you could confirm that obviously the panel made some very, very welcome recommendations and the government no doubt has some great ambitions, but ultimately it's Parliament that decides what should be done. Uh, and my second question is, uh, Scottish ministers did quite a bit of work in the back end of 2015, looking at the uh, recommendations of the Land Reform Review Group on a number of issues around housing in terms of uh, public interest-led development, majority land assembly, etc. and there were working groups set up. Are the outcomes of that work going to inform the uh, work that you're taking forward here in these working groups on this? in response to this panel? Um, convener, Parliament always uh, ultimately um, decides. Um, I'll bring in Mr McNerney uh, about the uh, working groups. Um, we'll, we'll take into account the, the outputs from the working groups um, in future legislation. Um, the scope of the planning bill will be for consideration, certainly. Um, in that territory, though, there's also commitments around um, improving compulsory purchase arrangements, which have been reflected in the programme for government. And the Scottish Law Commission have been carrying out a review. We expect to get their um, analysis of responses from that in the next few weeks. Um, and we'll also outline what steps we can take in the short term 
to enhance and make more straightforward um, compulsory purchase procedures too. You can take the fact for the time being. I'm not, I'm not entirely, there was a lot of good work done around about six or so issues, and I'm not entirely clear. I know it's not the Minister's portfolio necessarily, but the act in practice, the issues that we're looking at are much in your territory. I'm, I'm still not clear whether formally you're going to be taking that work forward into this review, but perhaps you can communicate formally with, by length. Um, I that. will um, look at the output from these um, working groups. Um, obviously, um, some of the stakeholders that, um, that will be um, at uh, next Monday and Tuesday's events are likely to raise some of these issues, I would imagine, too. Um, but I will look at, at this um, uh, and see um, what the output from that um, would add in terms of, of the um, development of the white paper. Uh, and, convener, I'll maybe um, write to, back to the committee in some more depth uh, around about that, um, because I have to say that I'm not entirely au fait with every aspect of those working groups. Thank you. That's very helpful, Minister Elaine Smith. Oh, thanks, Convener. Actually, Minister, it's back to, it was a supplementary on the issue of enforcement, so if I might just return to that, if you don't mind. Um, rather than uh, enforcement, I suppose it's about how, how, how would you tackle or how does this process tackle uh, the blatant avoidance of rules, if you like, and I give the example of the, the visual pollution of advertising boards that are littering the country, and actually, it's not just about... The, the look of them, they could also be dangerous when they're up the sides of motorways. There's certain rules about um, posters that you could put at the sides of roads and motorways, but they get around it, and I presume they get around it because they put them on what are supposedly called portable um, boards, but we know they're not. They're, they're there indefinitely. Um, so I wonder, so rather than just about enforcement, is there anything in it that can look at the way that, that some of the rules that are there are being got round, basically? I'm certainly willing to look at uh, any anything uh, that may be getting got round, as 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 you put it. Um, yes, um, I I think we we can certainly have a, a look at these things. I'm not entirely sure of um, the designation of some of these things. Um, maybe Mr. McNerney can help me in that regard. Um. I think you might be referring to agricultural agricultural ve vehicles because there'll be an exemption in the advert regs, which are quite ancient actually, around uh, using agricultural vehicles um, which can display an advert. Um, we haven't looked at the advert regulations for a very long time. There's not been any pressure to do that. Um, so if it became a priority, then we, we would obviously do that. In the first instance, though, enforcement, whether it's for adverts or anything else, is really down to, to the planning authority, identifying and then addressing and removing adverts that don't have any uh, expressed consent. I, I realise, Convener, that um, we're maybe not answering in depth enough for uh, Ms Smith in that regard, so we'll send more detail o on that to, to you. Uh, th that's very helpful. I, I suspect the detailed briefing you have in front of you've been asked about advertising hoarding was a bit of a curveball, <laughs> Minister. I think we can we, 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 we can forgive that one, even for the depths think, of your knowledge. I think uh, briefings often cover a lot of bases. Um, I, I'm never surprised by curveballs, uh, Convener. Um, but, you know, I, I, there's no point in me trying to give uh, any great detail because I don't have it, but we will write to the committee yeah. about it. That's great. And although, of course, in Glasgow, they've helped greatly as a planning authority because they've banned uh, election uh, materials and all their street furniture, which I know as a, the political activists in Glasgow of all parties are quite grateful for that because we don't only have to put them up, we have to take them down oh, yes. as well. Any campaign for me was always climbing up lamp posts, putting up posters. So um, and this, I don't agree with the And this is definitely going off on a tangent now, <laughs> Minister. Um, can I ask one very brief question? I suspect the answer will have to be the working groups will look at it, but I raised it in, 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 in the first session. And it was just a slight concern over the, the development plans, which I, I know are set for 10 years, but they're reviewed every five years, and I appreciate the issues around you're just settling into development planning, you have to review it again for that long-term strategy. Um, I suppose the concern I have is that if you don't get the development plan right in the first place, you're locking in 
uh, unsatisfactory aspects of the development plan in my own experience in Glasgow. And I suspect it's just a cultural thing with planning authorities across the country. I don't think any particular issue about Glasgow is that planning authorities are not particularly good at making elected representatives, never mind local communities, aware of anything contentious in relation to their city or local plans. They'll go through almost a very basic statutory process and unless it's dangled in front of your nose, you would never know it was happening. And that's sometimes the most contentious of changes to local plans. And if we are to accelerate uh, planning approvals and get more houses built and build sustainable communities, we have to move quicker on that. And we have to make sure the development plan is fit for purpose in the first place. So I'm just wondering, given there's an indication of reviewing development plans less often, if there'll be a health check around making sure there's robust consultation with communities and where possible co-production of some of those development plans? I think um, one of the things which has come up again and again and again um, and even before uh, I, I came into this role convener um, is people who are at the core face of um, the development of these plans would say they had no longer finished one, they were starting on the other and we weren't actually delivering anything um, that was in the original plan. So the focus was on continuous planning, if you like, but not necessarily about delivery of what was in the plan. Now, I would expect um, everyone uh, to have health checks, as, as you call them, uh, in terms uh, of, of any uh, aspect of work that they're doing. Um, but I think, you know, one of the key things as well in terms of um, participation from communities um, was in some regards, some of them were worn out as well by moving from the development of one onto another. And communities themselves would say, why are we not seeing any change, any of the development that was proposed uh, in the plan that we took part in? And then you get drop off from that as well and less participation. So I think that the balance that is proposed um, looks right. Obviously, again, uh, this will be something that we will deal with in the workshops. Folk may have other views. There may be um, uh, some good points that come out uh, in that regard. Um, but, you know, I think that previously it was just plan after plan after plan after plan and not a huge amount of delivery. And I think we've got to strike that balance right and actually ensure that tangible change can take place. I think that's a reasonable point, Minister. We're, we're just coming to the end of our time. Can I just check for, for, for clarity? I don't think... Uh, planning bill was in the programme for government as announced by the First Minister yesterday. I didn't think it, it was. Can I just check what your anticipated timescales would be for any legislation coming through Parliament? Um, autumn 2017, convener. Okay, that's that's what you call clarity. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Minister, just before we, we move into private session, we've been asking all the questions. We're keen to have a constructive dialogue with, with, with government in relation to this. Is there anything that you want to put on the record yourself, Minister, or indeed Mr McNerney, uh, before we, we close today's session? I'll let Mr McNerney go first if he wants to. Um, we'd be happy to come back and give you informal updates on the progress with, with the review. Um, whatever information you need or briefings that would be helpful, whether it's face-to-face -face or electronically, and we'll do all that we can to keep you up to speed as, as things develop. Okay. Um, um, we are trying to create a, a more open and transparent system um, and uh, in order uh, for you to be able to scrutinise that properly, we need to be open and transparent with you as well. Um, we will keep you updated of where we are um, in the process. Um, and, you know, if there is anything that the committee requires, um, I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, and as I've said to um, the committee on my uh, previous visit here, I'm more than happy to come back at any point on this or any other issue. 
we very much welcome that, that offer and ongoing engagement. So all there is to do is to thank the Minister and Mr McNearly for your time uh, this morning, now this afternoon, and we now move to agenda item four, which we previously agreed to take in private. Thank you. Thank you.